Hey everyone, it's Tuesday night, and that means it's Game Face time. Right here on Sifted Games at Sifted.net, we're going to run through the very best and the brightest, and the not so brightest, yeah. of video games for the week. We have a great <laughs> show for you guys tonight, but before we get going, we got our shirts, people. Sit up straight so you can see. This is the white with the violet. They're on the store now. Right now there's a huge graphic on the top of the home page. And if that's gone, maybe you're watching this a couple days later, you can always click on the Sifted logo and there's a drop down there that has merch. So this is the white with violet. All right, so I see Sam's got me on that other camera there. Here is the orange with blue. That's mine, but I'm not allowed to wear it Yeah, yet. this is Matt's, but I'm not letting him put it on yet because I wanted to show it to you guys. I'll show you guys the back too, because that's one thing you guys didn't really see. See where the Sifted logo is there, center of the back. And then I'll show you guys the light blue with the dark blue. And then there's the back. The shirts came out amazing. I don't know with the stream quality if you can see it, but the screens are sick. Been wearing these around for a couple days in LA. I've had no less than three people come up to me and ask me where I got these. So that's a pretty good sign that people are digging the shirts. I hope you guys are too. Did you take them back to your car at that point? No, I was wearing yeah. I was wearing the shirt. I'm selling them out the trunk. Come on. <laughs> I probably should have. I should have just kept them in the car and been like, yeah, just, I don't know if you watch Better Call Saul, but like mm -hmm. right now, have you watching the, the new season? No. Oh, well, he's selling like burner phones out of the mm -hmm. trunk of his car right now. Maybe I should just go to like over to a Walmart or something <laughs> and just stand there with the shirts or whatever. But I am very, very happy with how they came out. Uh, to reiterate from last week, again, if you're on the ends of the spectrums on size, if you wear a small, you wear a double XL or triple XL, you should go buy those shirts right now. I actually checked some of the orders earlier today and already people are starting to snatch those up. So uh, if you wear any of those extreme sizes on a small, double XL, triple XL, do not wait. Uh, you should probably get your shirts as soon as you can because they are going to be gone. So, and I'll keep you guys updated on stock and all that. Of course, in the store, you'll be only, only be able to see if we actually have a size, but I'll let you guys know like in a week or two how many we have of each so you guys know if you can wait. I know obviously a lot, all of you guys can't just go buy them right away. You're waiting for payday or whatever, so I totally get it. So we'll keep you updated on that stuff. Really, really happy with how the shirts came out. They are absolutely my favorites that we have made so far, and I hope you guys agree. Uh, those of you watching on YouTube, you can buy the shirts. Anyone can buy the shirts. You don't have to be a subscriber. Uh, you don't have to be a patron. Um, anybody can go buy them. Uh, so folks on YouTube, you're welcome to pick them up as well. Um, also, uh, thank you folks on YouTube. You guys have been really hooking us up with the Twitch Prime stuff. Um, we've talked about it on the show before. I'm gonna reiterate it again. You can give us a free $2.50 every month through Twitch Prime. There are instructions down in the description below. I'm not going to go through how to do that. It's very, very easy. And if you've already done it once, it's literally one click to do it for every consecutive month because they don't just let you subscribe to a channel. You have to do it every month. So thank you to everyone who's done that for Game Face on YouTube. Thank you to everyone who's done that for Pactor Factor on YouTube. We really, really appreciate it. So with that, let's get on to the show. We got an action-packed show. We got tons of content to get through. So let's just start rocking right away. Uh, we're going to talk about what is undoubtedly the biggest story of the week and probably the biggest story of the summer in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And that is that- Now it's fall now. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, what, two days ago is the first day of fall. Yeah. Uh, Telltale Games has gone under. Under. It's gone. Well, they're shutting down. I don't know if they want, I mean, it, it, we, I, there's a lot of clarity left, I think, and I think the uh, ensuing lawsuit will uh, maybe give some clarity on that. But, yeah, so um, a couple quick updates. Um, one, there's a private investor coming in. So. Maybe we should start at the beginning. Yeah. At the beginning, um, Telltale said that it is not it was not going to be able to complete the last season of The Walking Dead. Yeah, they were going to finish converting Minecraft story mode to the Netflix show version. They're right. Doing, uh, with the remaining 25 employees, and that was it. Yeah. And The Walking Dead episode 2 just came out. Yes. Or like today. I yeah, think. like reviews yeah. when it came, up, came out yesterday for it. Um, and but, they're saying... And so initially they said... The season wasn't going to finish. Now, since then, mm -hmm. a private investor has stepped up and has said that he's willing to come in and fund the rest of The Walking Dead. Which is good news for the people who weren't going to get refunds for their right. season pass. They weren't, yeah. I mean, that's the thing that happens when you file for bankruptcy is 
Have they done that? They have not yet. Yeah, because I was going to say. I mean, that's coming, obviously. Theoret, I mean, well, especially now that there's a, there's a class action suit against them uh, by the employees who were fired with no severance and no... Uh, no severance. And no... 60-day uh, uh, notice. notice. Yeah, yeah there's, there's laws about that, it turns out. Yep. Um, if you're going to have mass layoffs, <laughs> you need to notify your employees at least 60 days yeah. in advance. And they got nothing. They got one no. day, not even a day. Like by the time they got back to their their desks from the meeting where they were told their their work Gmail accounts were already deactivated. Yep. It was uh, it's a bad scene. As someone who's been through a lot of layoffs, although only one of them caught me. I think anyone um, who's worked in corporate America has dealt with layoffs at this yeah, point. Yeah, but I've just it's never just seen anything like is. this. Like this is yeah. This is unusual. Like, I mean, Capcom did it right with Capcom Vancouver. Like, yeah. they gave every, gave everybody a benefits and uh, and payout through you know severance through a, a very reasonable amount. I think more than legally required, if I remember yeah. correctly. Um, They're just, a Japanese just, company. Yeah, this is just how it's done. <laughs> I mean, you know, we found out at G4. We found out. Uh, I think it was more than sixty days, a little over. It was like October, and our last day was like December 21st or something. Well, I remember some, I can't I don't know if it was you, somebody called me from there and was like, oh, we all got laid off. And I was like, oh God, that's terrible. And I'm like, well, you know, you guys are all looking for work. I'll try to find what I can for you guys. They're like, well, I have like two months. Yeah. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, so wait, you have to work for two months under the, yeah. Well, they, the they, precipice that you're losing your job. Yeah, well, they and, did that to us at Tech TV too. Yeah, they like, did. They, they fired everybody. Was it even two months? It was. They fired us all in, in uh, well, it was barely two months because we found out something was happening in like April. And yeah. then they had the meeting that told us we were all fired and had to reapply for our own jobs. Right. The morning we were flying to E3. Right, yeah. And then our first day in uh, at G4. Yeah, we had was to a, reapply for had our to reapply own for all, And they put the wrong listings up and yeah, we were like, yeah, this, our right. jobs aren't here. And yeah. they, they straightened it out, but like, like, and then our first day in, I remember our first day in, uh, at G4 in LA was like August 4th or August yeah, 2nd, yeah. something like that. Uh, so it was not quite two months. Yeah. Um, but I think that was actually before uh, Warren, the, the, the law that makes it, that give, makes 60 days the standard. I think that law had not gone into it. That, that law passed in 2003, and I don't know if it was in effect by the time we got laid off at yeah. TV. So let's talk about what went wrong at Telltale. Um, I mean, people know... We I've... kind of already talked about it a couple shows ago. We, we, we went into that a little bit in the Life is Strange uh, discussion, I think. Did we? we? We just talked about Telltale recently, yeah, about how like they didn't haven't evolved the the game engine and like I'd like to play more of their stuff, but it's just like. But we had no idea what. No, what no was one knew. There. No, no, no one. No, uh, this came out of nowhere for everybody, including the people who work there. Although it should be noted that the guy running the like took over to run the place recently and is still you know did this. He's the guy from Zynga that liquidated Zynga, too. I mean, this, he seems to be a deconstructor, basically. Like, if you need someone to sort of take your company apart from the inside, you know, because you're going down the tubes, basically, this is, a, this is a guy who can do that, it sounds like. I think what we discussed a few weeks ago, though, is different than this. Because we talked about why we were kind of falling out of favor with Telltale's games, mm -hmm. which is a part of it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's other people out there who feel that way. I mean, well. sir, yeah, go watch Jim Sterling's video. Right, but that um, doesn't mean that they shouldn't have stayed in business. So let's talk about the mistakes that Telltale made to get it to this point, other than, hey, you probably should have updated that engine mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah, I mean, I, our discussion was about, like, yeah, the, the lack of appeal of a lot of these things as they continue to grind out the same thing over and over again, not the idea that somehow this company that was uh, dealing with all these super high-profile licensed things were not making their deals with these licenses to the to the point that they would automatically come out ahead like that's the weird thing to me is like how do you not negotiate that so that this we're going to make this batman game but how do you not negotiate that so that no matter how the batman game sells you still recoup your costs yeah, because, because you're dealing with this huge property these ip owners should have been paying telltale more than enough money to make these games right and it sounds like, and we don't know this for a fact, but it sounds like Telltale was putting itself out to be able to get access to the IP. Yeah, I think and it that sounds is like that was happening. And that is not the way it should have been working. And that combined They were doing with, a service to the IP holders. Yeah, and that combined with their really aggressive uh, expansion plans of, of like just constantly making content, uh, sounds like to the detriment of a lot of the developers. Uh, there were a lot of bitter developers talking about how much overtime they'd worked and now they weren't even getting severance, let alone overtime pay. 
um, which is a good lesson. I mean, yeah, the, the company the company doesn't care about you. Like that's that's a the, the that's lesson. That's the truth of that. across yeah, the absolutely. board. Let's just be honest. Like, like don't. Yeah, I, I, you know, not to go back to Batman, but I mean, yeah, every once in a while a villain says something that can be used in life. Yeah. And uh, in The Dark Knight, the Joker says, if you're good at something, never do it for free. Yeah. And uh, that, is a, that is actually very good advice, even if it comes from a sociopathic maniac. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, and, and like, that's just prevalent in the game. And, and I mean, you even saw, like, there were people on Twitter... Saying like, oh, if the de- the developers really believed in the in the Walking Dead game they were making, they'd finish it for free. And it's like that is not how <laughs> anything works. Good one. And they're, they're like modders work for free. I'm like, yeah, modders have another job typically. Well, like, he, there is also another point to be made in there, which is, you know what? They don't really care about it. It's their no, job. It's their job. Also, like, make it on what? Where are they supposed to break back into the office and like resurrect the file servers? And like, it's like that's not. I've talked about this a million. The times. reaction to this has been very strange, and yeah. some, some from some directions. I've talked about this a million times about how game players, fans, gamers, whatever you want to call them, romanticize everything. They think that everybody working on their favorite game loves it just as much as they do, and they're as invested in it as they are. And they, some people are. I'm yeah, sure. there's a few. But some people are just coding so they can eat. Right. I mean, it's a job. It's their vocation. So to assume that they should just go and work for free no. because they love The Walking Dead as much as you do, <laughs> it's so delusional Especially after it's and like, naive. Oh, these people got no severance. They Their income's gone now. Yeah. Like, they, don't, you know, they need to start worrying about how they're going to pay October's rent. Yeah. I think what's really struck me with this scenario and a bunch of others that have happened over the last six months is I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm really starting to realize that a lot of the people that love games, follow games, get obsessed over games, are still really young. They're, I mean, we, we, you know, they say the average age of the the gamer is 35 or whatever the hell it's supposed to be now. Well, it's Uh, more like 43 now. Right, or whatever they say it is. Still, the, the truth is the vast majority of people who care enough about games to be vocal about them are still really young and really immature. And it's, for me personally, it's become increasingly difficult to deal with those people because I'm not even... You know, I'm young for my age, at least as far as my attitude is concerned, but now I'm getting to the point where I'm old enough where even being young for my age makes me makes it hard for me to relate to a lot of the people in our industry anymore. I just can't. Like, I can't handle the juvenile crap <laughs> that happens in our industry all the time because you have 14 and 15-year-old kids trying to tell a 40-some-year-old guy, yo, you need to go and work for free. It's like, F you, bro. Like... I think a big part of it is that a lot of the people who are vocal online are of that age. They've never had a job. Or if they do, they're working at, just like we did when we were kids, they're working retail or whatever. They don't know what it's like to have a career and work at a corporation where there's all this other crap that's going on underneath the surface. And Or sit in a, in a boardroom meeting where you, the, the guy who no one can contradict decides to change this whole thing. Right. And you just have to do what you're told whether you know it's going to make a terrible product or not. Yeah. Like that's just and, the reality and, of it. And even looking from their perspective back when I worked in retail, that stuff kind of happened. But it, it's not on the scale that it happens when mm. you get into well, like, your career. Well, also when you're in that like a you know retail position like that. I worked I worked standard retail for over ten years from like when I was before I really should have been. Um, I was doing like odd odd retail jobs when I was thirteen and stuff. Wanted your own money, and because I want yeah, I, I had comic books to buy. Damn it, yeah, and. Um, uh, you imagine that, like, whoa, if I was in the world of, of game pub press, it wouldn't be like this because everything's cool there. If I was a developing video games, everyone's a creative master who doesn't make stupid choices there. It's like, you, no, it's, it's like that everywhere. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's just an, you're in a nicer room having the meeting with the people that don't know what they're talking about, but, like, you're still having that meeting. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, too, is when you start working at big companies, you're not making, like, one big decision every, like, three or four weeks. Mm-hmm. You're making like 10 a day. And when you're making that many big decisions in that amount of time, it's easy to make one wrong decision that could mm-hmm. have a huge ripple effect on down the line. And I'm not covering for Telltale here at all. Because in my opinion, the reason Telltale is in the status in right now is because it was horribly managed. Absolutely mm-hmm. terribly managed. They negotiated terrible con. There's no reason that Telltale, as we sit right now, has had two games, not even two games, two seasons of its games that ever turn a profit. That is mind-boggling. Yeah, if you I don't think, think that's about, anything we would have ever assumed. If you think about the hype 
coming out of season one of The Walking Dead, when it won Game of the Year and all this, all these accolades, to mismanage that to where it is now is, I don't know if I've ever seen it before. It's unusual, that's for sure. I mean, just like, if you're dealing with someone, I mean, if they were making their own original... That was, original, what, eight years ago? Was it 2010? What, Walking Dead? Yeah. I think that was 2012. Was it 2012? I want to say, yeah. Uh, hmm. That Somebody, was, maybe I'm, someone in the chat. I'm pretty can. sure that was the end of G, G4. Was yeah. de at December. That could be. So I do remember sitting in a mostly empty office, boggling at the fa the the idea that that one game of the year. Yeah, I was completely boggled by. It. I mean, I mean, not to I take not... away from that game because yeah, yeah. I did like it, but it's. I like, mean, it's... honestly, it's one of the best adventure games that have been made in quite a long time. That you know, I'm well documented on The Walking Dead and how I didn't feel like it deserved Game of the Year that year, but. Mm. But that's not why they're in the place they're in now. No, but like it's like if you're gonna do that, like the if you're gonna work. I mean, if it'd be one thing if it was like a don't nod situation where they were making original content, original story driven games that like just weren't selling. Yeah. But almost everything they do is as a high, very high profile license. And it has like, a built in audience. Yeah, built in audience, and also it should be a built in payment system like if you're gonna if, like that's the whole reason to do license stuff is a guaranteed income not guaranteed income like oh we're gonna make a ton of money but guaranteed like risk-free development costs like you're gonna they're gonna cover your costs right and then you're gonna share the pro is that's what insomniac did with sony you know like like sony funded the game yep. and they're gonna split the split the profits once everything once sony gets paid back for what they put into the game yep. like it was it was you know low risk for Sony because Sony has tons of money to, to to throw at this and it's a very well known IP and it's no risk to Insomniac because they didn't have to spend any of their own money. So what happened? Like why weren't they making those kinds of deals at Telltale is the question, and I don't know if we can answer that question without knowing the psychology of the people running the company. I and think I another mistake, and people may argue against this because of how well the first season did, but I think another thing that may have hurt Telltale is that. Its biggest IP, which is The Walking Dead, was based on the comics and not the TV show. Hmm. And look, you can say, can well, the first season was so successful, and I agree, it was very successful, but I think it's hard to sustain that level of excellence. And when you have dips down, if you do, if it was based on the TV show, the fans of the show maybe still buy those episodes that people aren't buying because it's based on the comic because it's not yeah. as good as the stuff before. Well, it certainly seems to be keeping them watching the TV show. Um, I don't know. I, I think, it, I mean, it is obviously the comic license and not the, the show license because they're not using show characters. And if they are using show characters, they're based on their appearance in the comic books, not the actor. Yeah. But I think this is, it's, it's nebulously removed enough that you could think it's part of the TV show universe if you want, at least as much as Fear of the Walking Dead is. Yeah. Um, Although those shows are crossing over now. Yeah. Well, they, they just, AMC just said that they intend to keep the Walking, the Walking Dead universe going for another 10 years. That might be tough. Um, I don't know if because The I, Walking Dead to me is not a good television show. Well, I don't. Anymore. I don't think they mean like that. The Walking Dead itself will continue for another ten years. I think they mean like they'll do more spinoffs. Right. Because I feel like I feel like you're reaching the end of the main show's lifespan here. But you could keep. Well, it's Fear already the Walk repeated the cycle like four yeah, times. Yeah, but you now. could keep Fear the Walking Dead going. You can come up with another. Hell, they could make a show out of this. Fear the Walking point. Dead is better than The Walking Dead now, in That's my what opinion, I hear. by a significant margin. I haven't watched uh, really anything from The Walking Dead since season two. Yeah. Um, the the episode where they they tried to spend an entire episode trying to pull a zombie out of the well uh, was kind of my breaking point. Oh, we and got an update in the chat from Vincent. It says uh, Telltale just stopped selling The Walking Dead the final season on most platforms. Mm. Probably wise until they secure and figure out what the hell's going on. Otherwise, you're selling something that just doesn't you're exist. You're just digging a deeper hole. Yeah. <laughs> you're selling something to people you're not going to be able to deliver. So, and now, and now like, you, I think today it was, they announced that, like, there's empl employees that were laid off are, uh, are uh, bringing a class action suit against them for, yep. I mean, I don't know if that's going to do anybody any good, because the implication is probably that they don't have the money to pay, pay anyone anyway, and uh, if they do, they'll probably end up settling for a very low amount. Um, but, you know, whatever helps these guys go to sleep at night. The yeah. other problem for Telltale is a lot of times when a company goes bankrupt, you sell all the assets. Mm -hmm. And then that's a way you can maybe pay some of the people yeah. the money. They don't own any of this stuff. They have nothing to sell. No. Have they ever made anything original? No. Can't think of anything. No. No. Sam, was Sam and Max original? I don't know if they own that might IP. Have been... That might have, might might own that IP now. Yeah, but otherwise, oh God, no. that was a long time ago. So they have nothing to sell. They have 
their equipment to sell. Yep. Like capital expenditure stuff. And like maybe their engine, if that was in Who's going to buy that? Right. <laughs> it's been the point of contention for the last like right. four years. No one's going to want to buy that. So they have no assets to sell to make it right with their employees either. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen the rest of the industry reaching out and trying to help these people. Lots of people saying, hey, we got this job, this job, this mm -hmm. job available, apply. Um, I, I think there's some kind of a thing that they're throwing for the employees that just like people in the general industry like- Like a got, mixer kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, through a mixer to like help them find jobs, like a little career fair or something. Yeah, so, the, the industry is pretty good about that. Absolutely. Like they're, they're, they're very good at you know, being aware of what's happening and, and finding people other places. I mean, you might have, might have to move out of the Bay Area. Yeah. But um, at this point, you probably can't afford it anyway. Nope. So. Well, yeah, especially if you, if you don't have a job because even if you have money saved, Three or four months I, yeah. in California oh, without money coming in, you're broke fast. And that's, fast. that's generous. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so it's just a bad, bad scene. Mm -hmm. Now, Matt, will you miss Telltale, the developer, at all? No. I won't either. I mean, I haven't played anything they've made since... Uh, Batman was the last thing I played. Batman's the last thing I finished. I played the first episode of Guardians of the Galaxy and never went back to me it. Me too. I, I started. I got like 20 minutes in and I just... That happened to me with the last season of The Walking Dead. I literally booted it up and played 10 minutes. And it got to some scene where like a zombie was walking towards me and I couldn't figure out like which direction they wanted me to point the analog stick. And then I did. <laughs> and then it didn't register it. And I was like, I'm done. I'm like, I, I don't care about this anymore. I don't care about the story. I had already missed like the last like full season. I didn't even know what was going on. I was just like, I just don't care anymore. I mean, my, um, I am sad that, that, uh, the Wolf Among Us season two won't happen. Cause that was one of their better ones. That one's definitely not happening. Yeah. No um, way. They didn't even, hadn't even started on that. And, uh, yeah, hopefully maybe Gearbox or someone can do something with the Tales, Tales of the Borderlands stuff, because that was also... I mean, that was maybe, good. Maybe incorporate some of that into uh, Borderlands 3, because um, that was that was really good. Uh, again, again, most of the really good elements come from the writing, yeah. I think, more than the writing and some of the performances, more than the actual gameplay. Um, so no, I won't miss them as a, as a game company, but I... I feel it's a shame that they don't get to, that no one gets to follow up on somebody but then maybe they will because it's not like telltale owns these ips like if if you know gearbox wanted to make a deal with don't nod or something to make a make another tales from the borderlands i'm sure that could happen do you think it's even creating a vacuum or a void that some other developer or publisher would even want to fill i mean if they weren't selling well enough to pay the bills and I don't see why you would like yeah. why, it seems like a losing proposition it does sounds like the only the only company that's figured out how to do this you know properly seems to be don't nod and they have their own IP and they they, they yeah, actually they, own they own uh, life is strange so yeah like I, I mean I, the whole no one's gonna be <laughs> I feel like no one's gonna be rushing in to start making DC comics you know story driven adventure games really. yeah I mean telltale was just so poorly managed not only was it just poorly managed with hey we have this idea we have this thing that we do it's this template it's this engine and we can plug any ip into it and we can have success with it not only were they short-sighted to think about that they didn't even think about hey we don't own anything mm -hmm. like what value do we even really have if we're just working with other people's ip yeah they should have been leveraged like at least coming up with one original thing at they least were, they were mixing in at yeah the time. i mean now they have nothing there's nothing to sell they can sell their computers and their workstations and like their desks. Yeah. But and I mean, you know, I I know a couple people that that work there. Uh, Job, that yeah. was our first sign something was going on. Mm -hmm. Job, the PR, the head of PR mm -hmm. at Telltale, he left there like eight months ago, and I was flabbergasted. I was like, "What? Why are you leaving there? Like you've been there for so long. You are the person who helped them." become what they've become and then he's like i'm leaving he didn't say why and mm. i was like he didn't have another job yet and i'm like what the heck is going on and then i just forgot about it and in hindsight i think he knew it was coming mm. well i don't think they did they hire another pr person they never did yeah like i would get um they knew they didn't have anything to pr also another red flag was i emailed just because what happened was they started just i used to get emails from job 
And then I just started getting emails from some random like telltale PR email address. Mm. And uh, when the last season of The Walking Dead was coming out like a few weeks ago, I emailed that address. I was like, hey, looking for review code. Usually it's just sent to me and I haven't got it. Never got a reply. Hmm. And I was like, that's weird. I'm like, but Job's not there anymore. Maybe, the, I don't know. I didn't know what was going on. And as it turns out, there was a lot going on. So um, look, we feel terrible for the people who work there. Yeah, well, I mean, I knew people that worked in development and writing, and I never heard a, I never heard a single positive story out of yeah. out of it. Basically, it's a, it was a it was a, a real a grind. Shop. Yeah, yeah. Like you were just working working stuff constantly, and sometimes stuff would suddenly change on the whims of the of the co-founder guy, and you just have to redo everything. But they wouldn't rebuild the schedule to accommodate that. You just have to do it twice as fast all of a sudden, or work like, twice as many hours. Yeah. Which it sounds like what was happening. That was, yeah, it sounds like a lot. Well, one, well, one group was saying, like, when the meeting was called, they just finished, like, working until 3 in the morning the night before to finish off something. And... Somebody couldn't have seen them working and came to them and be like, you know what? Go home. Yeah. Some, not, somebody could have done that. At least that one little courtesy mm-hmm. of, like, you know, just take tonight off. Yeah. Go get some dinner. I mean, even at the... Go hang the, out with your family. Even at the daily grind that was television when stuff like that happened, even when it, we weren't the ones getting fired... You'd, you'd have the managers come in and be like, just go to the bar. Yeah. Go, go. go get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why go, you should go. Just go see your people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't appear like anything like that happened of the sort no. of telltale. So just terrible management. I mean, I feel like we could have done a better job running that company. I hate to say it, but... <laughs> Bold statement. <laughs> We've been in this thing a long time, Matt. We have yeah. a pretty good idea of what works and what doesn't. Well, like, I would definitely have asked for more money that, from my licensors than it cost to make the thing I was making. Yeah, absolutely. That, that would That's have just definitely... like <laughs> business one Like, I just don't know what you're doing that you're spending that money What's that the fast. end game there? I don't know. What's the win? How do you come out of that ever winning? And if they were lic- you know, licensed games that were paying the bills properly, where was that money going? Yeah. Just, just expanding out into more of a sweatshop scenario? I or like, I don't, I don't understand where, like, you know, that's the point of doing licensed, you know, if you look at, um, watch, uh, watch uh, Danny O'Dwyer's uh, Rocket League uh, documentary and the head of uh, Psyonix, is it Psyonix that yep. made that? The head of Psyonix, like, talks about how when they were making Rocket League their baby, they were, meanwhile, doing contract work for other companies. And the whole point was... It was paying the bill. You know, that stuff where you do work for other people is how you pay the bills to make your own personal stuff. Yep. And now they don't have to worry about it because Rocket League's a giant success. But, like, that's the that's the model. Like, that's the model. It's like the reason you make Batman or the reason you make Guardians of the Galaxy is because Marvel and DC have the money to pay you more than you need to make, make this game. And you yeah. can st- keep, keep the lights on and make something that has enough appeal that might make you a little extra profit. In the meantime, you work on these other things that you maybe want to take a risk on, or or you play it totally safe, you know, playing it totally safe and just making licensed stuff the whole time. That's a totally valid strategy. It's like now it's now it's a a, a riskier one as you see because when, yeah. if if shit hits the fan, you don't have anything to sell also off. Also, provided you sign contracts right. that actually have some make some semblance of sense, like and if it hits which, the point where like you you know these things just aren't selling and the and like I mean, but it's like if if Batman didn't sell, why did Warner Brothers decide to make a second season with them? Yeah. Like, uh, yes, it, it, there's because a lot it's of... get, cause it was getting the good end of the deal. Yeah. That's exactly why. Yeah. Because it was like, no skin off our backs. You're We're making mm-hmm. money off of this deal. You call us like three times a month to ask us stuff about canon. Yeah. Like, what and, are we really doing? And you wonder speculatively if there was a situation where it's like, you know, were you taking lesser deals in the name of we want to work on Batman or right. we want to work on Minecraft. Minecraft. Or I mean, Minecraft worked out okay, it sounds like, because it, it was it the was first season. The first season of Minecraft, the first season of The Walking Dead were the two only profitable yeah. seasons they ever did. And there was another, there was some other deal they had coming up with, uh, mm, it was some, some other game. It was another game. I don't think that ever, it was a contract that was going to be profitable but I don't, it never came to light. It was another game I can't remember. It's called like Let uh, Light a Day or something like that. It was like a. It sounded like a horror game or something they were working on. I can't remember what it was called. I'm sure someone in the chat does. But that of course didn't matter because they they never got to, got around to doing that. What does this say for unionization of game developers? Um, does this make it a better idea? Well, no, because I think it's always been a good idea. But like. 
it's good it's more evidence why it's a good idea but like at the same time it's like evidence why it doesn't work because like you're always going to have people that are willing to work for free till 3 a.m in the name of they'll just get someone else who'll do that you know yeah like it's but if uh, it's a union they can't get someone else to do it right but then you just have publishers making non-union stuff yeah for because there's always gonna be someone who's willing to throw their life away for the sake of working on this thing the one thing i would say about a union though is if they were in a union they would have got paid for their overtime this whole time seven days to die that was the thing Uh, that that was their they, uh, they would have been getting paid for their overtime all this time, mm-hmm. and they wouldn't be so far in the hole when the company folded. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, and they probably would have had to have given them more notice for layoffs. And I mean, I guess when a company ends up filing for bankruptcy, probably a lot of those bets are off anyway. Yeah. It's like, if you're filing for bankruptcy, you can't drain blood out yeah. of a turn. Well, they haven't filed for it yet. Right. And like They're going to, though. Theoretically, I mean, you had the the guy, the founder of the company, the guy running the company, was saying like, "Oh, it's not totally over yet." It's just like, no, you don't want to be tweeting that. Like yeah. that's that's a bad look for if you're about to have to file for, you know, yeah, you can't file for bankruptcy while the guy running the company or whoever that was, it was a higher up guy, but he was basically I can't remember his name, but he was basically saying like, "Oh, well, well in some form." It's like, no, not in some form. Like that's 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 like see, that's like tacitly admitting you have assets left to yeah. run the company like you yeah, can't but do you're that. saying you can't pay anybody anything. yeah you can't pay anybody but we're not but dead we're not yet done. it's like mm, yeah, that's not no yeah, that's, that's not what fly. that that's not what that is yeah so look we feel terrible for the people at telltale it's awful uh the hours that they work that i mean in all honesty they're just never gonna get paid for yeah it's just i mean i know how that is too but like yeah <laughs> but a lot of late nights at the at the old tv station but uh yeah i mean i've been fortunate enough that at the very least, every time I've ever left a job, I was paid everything I was yeah. owed. I mean, that's that... That's true. That's true. I mean, I, I may not have got severance. I think maybe one time I got severance of like two weeks or something like that, well, which they, I got is severance. nothing in I got, California. I got a lot of... I got... Because yeah, I'd been there for years Oh, when he left years, G4, when, you mean? When they, laid it, when they fired me at G4, when they shut G4 down, or production down, rather, because G4 kept airing for two more years. Right. Um, Just so weird. Well, it was supposed to be turned into Esquire, and then I think it turned out that once you fired all the production people, it actually turned kind of profitable. Because Mar- like, the movies, like we have, did movies that don't suck, and that actually pulled in a decent uh, viewership. And yeah. cop, cop, everyone made cops. fun of Cops. But <laughs> cops kept that channel on the air for like six years, It kept man. Spike on the air for a long like time. That, cop, the problem with Cops was that it rated really well, and the people who watched it didn't watch anything else on the channel. No. That was, it was just like 60-year-old white dudes watching, and it's watching and Cops it, beat people up, and then like they just switched right off as soon as well, like, they didn't the care what came. network it was no, on. No, it didn't matter where it was. Yeah. My, my favorite thing was one of that ever was I was scrolling. It was a period where on my cable system, uh, G4 and Spike were right above. Like Spike was right under G4. Was it just a block of cops? No, it said uh, G4 <laughs> said cops, 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 and then Spike TV said jail, 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 jail. jail, jail. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, Spike would strip jail out. <laughs> Bar rescue. That's another one that Spike strips out all the time. I mean, Spike doesn't exist now, but yeah. And I remember we, when Net- CSI we had for a long time, yeah. and those episodes did huge. When Netflix uh, first went uh, streaming, the first thing I ever binged was Deadliest Warrior. Yeah. Like the first three oh, seasons. Oh, that was like that, Spike's hit. Like, yeah. That was. I had just started working there on Spike, like as like the head of digital, like promoting all Spike shows. And it was just like one awful show after another, just trying to put lipstick on a pig. And then we had Deadliest Warrior. And immediately, mm-hmm. like immediately, like you'd put together all these plans to promote these shows. We'd have all this content that we'd make. Like we'd go behind the scenes. That nobody watched any of it for any of those shows. And that show, the night that it hit for the first time, I went to our website and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there are comments on like the content that we're creating. like. It was tough. So. It was a really good idea. Yeah. It, was a, it just was, ran out of... Out yeah, of, I mean, there's only so much, you know, you're going to run yeah. out of warriors to yeah. be deadly. Um, <laughs> as, a, as opposed to, like, you know, it was, it was kind of the, like, uh, like Ninja Warrior. American Ninja yeah. Warrior, where it's like... that. Now know, it's gigantic, though. Oh, yeah, because they took it away from G4 and right. put it on NBC. <laughs> like, that was basically... The, like, that was, like, I remember the people who, like, found that show and, 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 like, kind of figured out how to make it and figured out how to shoot it for American television, like... None of them got taken along oh, no. with that. Like they all got, that they all works. just got fired along with the rest of us. And and NBC was just like yoink. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> we'll put that on the air. <laughs> and I still get, it's like, oh, American Ninja Warrior is such a great show. Wow, I watch it all the time. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, we found that. Yeah, when, in Japan. Like, I know the people who invent, who found it in Japan and invented how to shoot it because it was shot differently there. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then they built it over here. Like, you know, there's a bunch of, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in uh, Ninja Warrior at all. But, like, there's a lot of people at G4 that put some blood, sweat, and tears into, into making that show what it was. And they never got anything All they got was their 50 grand a year salary. Yeah, they got their salary <laughs> and they got a nice, uh, nice uh, I don't know, a little, little, little challenge coin for yeah. being there 10 years or something. Yep. But, again, that goes back to the, that tweet from the Telltale developer. The company doesn't care about you. Right. Yeah. Get paid or don't. Do it. Do it. Yeah. You know? And he's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you ever find yourself in a situation where a job is working you yeah. and not paying you, you need to start looking for I mean, job. yeah. I mean, keep your job. Do what you got to do to keep the job, yeah. obviously. You but can't look just... for another one while you're yeah. doing that job. But know yeah. that that's a sign that you need to find something that's going to treat you more like a human being. Yeah. And look, in some ways, you know, some of that stuff, I hate to say it, is a little bit on the employee for allowing them to run them over in a lot of cases but i mean you end up in situation also like if you've been there since you know since like 2011 or whatever since it got big like one of the reasons i stayed at g4 as long as i did because i'm like by the time if they fire us my severance is going to be huge yeah (laughs) and like didn't work out for telltale though right but like that again legally you expect that because that's how companies are supposed to mandated to work that's how that works i think in california is there is a severance law isn't there yeah so telltale's in all kinds of trouble yeah there, this is not over this is going to be you're going to be seeing updates about this for a couple years I yeah but uh yeah so there you go telltale rest in peace uh to everybody who worked there uh best of luck surely some talented people there like the writers um the people who worked on the cinematics those people are really really talented and i have a feeling they're going to end up landing mm-hmm. on their feet somewhere so best of luck to you guys um and really sorry this yeah. happened but it also sucks that like I think most of them are probably gonna have to leave the north, you know, San Rafael area, which is a beautiful, beautiful area, yeah, really is, nice place yeah. to live. So and now they're gonna pay way more money to live. Somewhere yeah, else. and it just, it just, you know, I'm, I, it sucks because like I was, you know, I saw some Telltale stuff. I had some friends that went up to work there. Uh, I even thought about it at one point, and it's just like, you know, because you look at that and you just, you would think that that was one of the surest bets for continued employment. You would think the budgets would be pretty low. You think that that would just, yeah, pretty low, and, like, the licensing stuff means that, like, you're always guaranteed to at least come out with break-even. Yep. Like, it just, it just... Uh, They screwed it up. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, what a sure thing, and what a a ball drop. Yep. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about another micro console. (laughs) This one's a little bit bigger than, like, the Neo Geo Mini or the Atari... Yeah, the 14th iteration of the crappy Genesis... Right. Emulator that they keep recycling yep. with, the, so, with the bad sound. Yep. So it was announced at Tokyo Game Show that the PlayStation Classic is on the way. A micro-sized version of the original PlayStation. Uh, tw- they're saying 20 games, mm-hmm. but only five have been announced so far. And not the cream of the crop, exactly. Well, there's one of them is a big deal. Yeah. Final Fantasy VII. Right. They've announced that that's going to be there. Yeah, and I mean, Tekken 3 is... You gotta have a Tekken in there. That's a PlayStation classic. Oh yeah, no question. Like any of them, you can put in there, and and it would yeah. make sense. I mean, they are. I think the five games they've announced are definitely. I would put them on a list of PlayStation One essentials. Yeah. Um. Maybe cup. Maybe Jumping Flash wouldn't make the top twenty, but like. It was a big deal at the beginning of the system's life, no question. Yeah, so there's R4, Ridge Racer, Type 4, Jumping Flash, and Wild Arms. Mm-hmm. Rounds out the five that they've announced. Um, first of all, let's talk about not just announcing something like this, because announcing something like this and saying, okay, here's five games that we have out of the 20, that's fine. The issue I have is that the thing was put up for pre-order immediately. Mm-hmm. And people are just expected, and I'm sure they are, to just go and buy this thing, really having no idea what 75% yep. of the content is going to be. I did. You went and ordered it. I ordered it. Why? Because in case it sells out uh, later on, I want to have one reserved so that if the other 15 games are good, I can have one. And if the other 15 games are not sufficient to me, I will cancel it. Or you could just sell it on eBay for like triple the price or whatever. Yeah, we'll see if that even... <laughs> I, just, I mean, joking. if they pick the wrong remaining 15 games, uh, the hype could die real quick. 
Um, and I feel like it's going to be an ongoing problem because those controllers don't have analog sticks. Yep, so let's go through the rest of the, the specs as they are. Um, no dual shock. No. They cut, it cut, does come with two I mean, I, wired controllers. I mean, I realize it's a cost cutting thing, but like, not even just like, not even, you don't even have to be dual shocks. They could just have a, you know, the dual analog something. You just have analog sticks. Like, you're, you're, you're limiting the games that play well and properly to basically the first two to three years of the system at that point, and that's not cool. Um, no post launch updates, so it doesn't have an Ethernet port so that you mm -hmm. can update it. Uh, that also means no online play. Which, yeah, I, I wouldn't have expected that, really. I don't know. It's, it's pretty nice to have if you're going to get a console that has games from 20-some years ago on it. Mm -hmm. To be able to play Tekken against somebody else, I think, would, would add some, some flavor to it. Um, you get an HDMI cable and two wired non-DualShock controllers. Um, so you're right. Was it the second year that it, they released analog sticks? Um, it was 97, because they obviously the N64 launch was sticks first, and then PlayStation... Yeah. And Saturn was first. ...ripped the idea. Were, was Saturn sticks analog sticks? Saturn's uh, analog controller for Knights in uh, 96. It was analog, though? Yeah. Like, the, it, it actually could... The, the stick, the little, little knobby thing was analog, and the triggers were analog. Okay. I wasn't sure. I, knew it, it had I, don't, sticks, think that, I don't think it beat the N64 to market... In Japan, but they, the, the analog controller with Knights did come out here before the N64 did. Okay. Um, so five games out of the 20. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about those five? Because honestly, to me, those five are not... I mean, they're no. not going to make me buy it. I like Wild Arms. If you're Arms. coming out of the gate... What, they just announced but, a new Wild Arms for mobile. Yeah. I like Wild Arms, but they're not like buy a $100 mini console like um also there's a better version of it on the ps2 um also i still own it and can play it on my ps3 right like, there's you know there's there's a lot of caveats to this where like, kind of, like part of the appeal of the super super nes classic to me was like here's a here's a way to play a bunch of these games on an, a modern tv where like it that's a hard thing to do with an actual super nintendo yeah but it's pretty easy to play PS1 games on a modern TV if you have a PlayStation 3 um, and the game, you know? Uh, so that's not as, it's not as appealing in that regard, but I did, I bought this, I bought the PlayStation 1 in summer 97. Um, my roommate had one for a long time when it first came out, so I didn't need one. And then after that, I got one in the summer of 97 in preparation for Final Fantasy 7, but I ended up playing Wipeout XL and Wild Arms most of the summer. And I ended up liking both of those a lot more than Final Fantasy VII. But yeah. like, so I didn't regret the purchase. But so I do have some nostalgia for Wild Arms for sure. But uh, I don't know if I really need to play it again. Frankly, um, we're going to get into our wish list here in a minute of games that we hope fill out the last fifteen. But one thing I would say is when I was kind of looking through and refreshing my memory on the library, one thing I've noticed about the PlayStation is that a lot of the games are either being remade. Or have already been remade. Yeah. So a lot of the biggest games are Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. All those games are getting redone already. Yep. What appeal would they have in their native form on this micro console? I don't know. Purists? I mean, those, a lot of those games are hard to look at now, yep. too. And that's the reason why they're and being remade. And again, would remade. you want to play some of those with no analog stick? Yeah, I, I would not. I yeah. absolutely would not. Playing a 3D game with a D-pad is one of the most awkward mm. things you could ever freaking do. Um... So it, it's kind of gimped out of the gate because mm -hmm. so many games are already getting remade. I mean, even Final Fantasy VII has been on every platform is coming to Switch now. It's like that doesn't really hold a lot of allure for a lot of people anymore because you can get that game on almost everything. Is there a mobile version of Final Fantasy VII yet? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Is there? So every platform has Final Fantasy Pretty VII. Much. That's not a selling point anymore for the PlayStation classic it's right. just not i mean it has to be on there if you're going to make this thing does it yeah it's the it's the, one of the defining games i don't even like final fantasy 7 but i'm not going to say it shouldn't be on there it's it's you know if it, i'm not saying it shouldn't be there i'm just saying i don't think it adds that much incentive no, for people to buy it i don't it think in, it does either but at least you don't need an analog stick yeah that's a good point and actually a lot of the rpgs i mean look there's tons of great rpgs on mm -hmm. playstation one I mean, honestly, I think I probably would be happier if they just put twenty, like the twenty best 
JRPGs on it. Yeah, you could you could do that. You, there are enough that you could pretty yeah. much fill it out, I think, with just that genre. Um, all right, let's start talking about games that we hope end up making up the uh, final 15 that they haven't announced yet. Um, I'll start, and I think we both are going to agree with this one, Metal Gear Solid. Oh, yeah. Like, when I you, mean, it's it, like, Final you Fantasy said Final VII. Fantasy VII. I think Metal Gear Solid is the one game that should be on there. It's never been remade. It's never really appeared on a ton of platforms. I think, I think they're both. Uh, well, it was remade, two, I guess. Twin Snakes yeah, for Twin GameCube. Yeah, Twin Snakes. They're the two defining. They're the two defining games of the system. Um, I even I even pulled out my copy of Metal Gear here, um, signed by Cam Clark, the voice of Liquid Snake. So. Uh, awesome. One of my favorite crazy over-the-top performances in gaming. Yeah. Uh, still probably my favorite game in the series, um, even without the eyes. I <laughs> mean, it's probably the best PlayStation 1 game. Uh, I would give that to Suikoden 2. Yeah. It's which, close. Which the Suikoden should be on that collection. But what, one thing I would, I would say to argue for Metal Gear Solid is that Metal Gear Solid, in a lot of ways, kind of laid down the template of how all modern action games are going to be made for a long time. I mean, this was really the first, like, AAA 3D action game. Yeah, I mean, presen... Because you weren't getting them from Nintendo. Production value-wise, You weren't even getting games like this from Nintendo. We learned pretty quick not to have a top-down perspective for a forward-facing stealth game. Yeah, yeah. Um, But but, just the tone, the writing, the Sure, but if you're going to say best game, that's Suikoden 2. Yeah. Um... This is this is a but this let, is very let's good. Let's be honest though. This game will sell more PlayStation classics than Sweet It Into. Oh well. sure, but I wasn't talking about marketing potential. I'm talking about the best game on the system, and that's yeah. Sweet It Into. Uh, but the other problem there, uh, and the the other defining game, I would say that belongs on this system would be Symphony of the Night. Just look at those textures. Um, just every single, around. all four <laughs> games we're talking about here are Konami. Yeah. Um, and that presents a whole other yeah, list which, of issues. Which I think is going to be a problem. I mean, Symphony of the Night may not make it on there just because we've seen, like, there's the, I think the Korean ratings board rated a Castlevania Requiem collection that would it has Symphony of the Night and Dracula Rondo of Blood on it. And Symphony of the Night's already been on Xbox it's been 360. Yeah, it's been on a couple of things. But I do think it's, it's a landmark enough game for the PlayStation 1 that it should be on there. I it agree. depends. If you're yeah. curating this, this thing as, like, a, a celebration of the things that made the PlayStation the PlayStation... Like, Metal Gear needs to be on there, yeah. and Soikoden should be on there, and Symphony Night should be on there. Like but I think what may be complicating, and maybe why we only know five of the 15 games when it's coming out December 3rd, which seems crazy, mm. maybe part of the problem is that a lot of these publishers either are starting to decide, hey, we're going to remake that. Yeah, that's Konami possible. right now could be thinking, we're going to remake Metal Gear Solid, so... Why would we thin it out, thin everything out, mm-hmm. thin out the market, and let them put it on the classic? Now the advantage is that um, Metal Gear already has a classics version available for PS3, yep. a PS1 version. The the limiting factor is that you can't play Metal Gear without an analog stick. Yeah. So it might just be disqualified by default. All the all because of something that probably cost them eighty cents hmm. per unit. I mean that's really what it comes down to. Or they're gonna or less. Or they're gonna put another one out. Right. PlayStation Analog Classic next year. <laughs> that would be dirty, but I would not put it past no, Sony to do that. I hate to say it, but I, I would not put it past them. All right, so let's start talking about some of the other games we would like to see. Uh, Metal Gear, I think that was probably top on both our lists, other than for you, Suikoden. It's just super obvious. Now, I would put Metal Gear above Suikoden in terms of forced inclusion on this system, because it's just... If you're going to make a PlayStation classic, it has to have Final Fantasy VII and Metal Gear Solid on it. It does. Like, bef- yeah. above all else. Yeah. Like, right there, you're done. Like, like those, Don't you those think two... If it... Like, you have 18 games to put on this system because the two top slots are taken Take by it. those two. Don't like, you think it. if Metal Gear was going to be on there, it would have been in the initial announcement? I think so. Yeah. And also, the analog sticks would be on the controller. Yeah. Like, it's just... It's not going to happen. Unless there's some way, um, some way to, like, say, oh, if you have the old controller, you can figure out if there's an adapter or something. I don't know. I, bet, I feel like they would have said something about that. Yeah. Unless they're still working that out. Here's some other games that I came up with. Uh, Legacy of Kane's Soul Reaver. I like that, but to me, the definitive... Again, no analog stick. Right. And also, the <laughs> definitive version of that is the Dreamcast version. It is. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really great game. It's a, it'll be a good pick. We already talked about Symphony of the Night. Mm-hmm. Here's one maybe just personally for me, Crash Team Racing. I don't care about Crash Team Racing, but it is popular, and people have been asking for it as a remaster, so... Um, you could probably play that with the D-pad. You might be able to... Yeah, I don't... Uh, I wouldn't want to. No, but you could. 
You could. I, I personally, I think Crash you might, Team Racing you is might. top five kart racing games of all time. Uh, I had a ton of fun with it. It was not as good as Mario Kart 64, but it's still a really good kart racing. There's tons of kart racing games that have come out since. It's still better than most of those. Yeah, is what I would argue. Um, Xeno Gears. Do you like Xeno, Xeno Gears? I hate Xeno it's, Gears. It's a polarizing game. I, just, I, I loved I, it. I played it at the time. I despise it. I think it's one of the worst written, worst paced games ever made. I do think it has one of the best soundtracks of all time. Yeah, I don't think anyone um, can deny that. Uh, I mean, Mitsuda firing on all cylinders is like nothing else. Yeah. Um, I do think it should be on there. It's a it's a defining game for the system, even if I don't like it very much. Um, like it should be there, uh, if only so people can suffer through uh, the the scrolling text with no speed control. Yeah. You forget. Right. You forget how annoying that yeah, is yeah. until you go back to I, it. I loved Xeno Gears. To me, it was um, one of the first RPGs I ever played that felt like it was made for older players. It wasn't just like a kid's RPG. I mean, a lot of those RPGs, most kids maybe would never make it through the games mm-hmm. because they're complicated to play. But that one was the first one where like the, the story and the tone of the game felt like it was at least made for like teenagers. Whereas, yeah, I guess so. It's just I, fe- I played it when I was like 22, and I thought it was... Like pethetically juvenile yeah. in terms of how it treated the subject matter and how lots long of religious took. undertones. It was like it was. It felt like in the wake of Evangelion, where like it basically is like let's just take a bunch of Judeo Christian iconography and throw it in a blender, and that's what this will be. You know, and and, yeah. and like there's some cool music stuff, and the animation animated sequences were neat at the time. Uh, giant robots are always welcome, except they were all sort of basic ripoffs of other giant robots. Uh, and then the second disc, they ran out of money, and the entire story is told by someone sitting in a chair narrating it to you. Yeah, um, which is. Funny, but like <laughs> not great in terms of you know finishing off your big epic story. Um, but it has an amazing soundtrack and a, a unique art style for the time. And uh, if we're really just talking about games that define the PlayStation One, Xenogear should be on there. Yep. Uh, next, I have Final I, Fantasy Tactics. To me, that's a no-brainer. That's to also, me, yeah. that's like. Almost in that same class as Final Fantasy VII and Metal Gear. I think most PlayStation 1 fans would agree. Again, I don't like Final Fantasy Tactics very much. Although, again, it has a really great soundtrack. It does, yeah. Um, also, also, I do think Tactics has a really good story. Uh, shocking, I played that game for, I think, like a, good over 100 hours or something. Um, I just didn't enjoy, I'm a Shining Force Fire Emblem fan, and I thought it was too limiting, and five characters is not enough to really make me interested, and there was a lot of weird balance problems that I thought were annoying. Uh, but I, I think it's it's an important enough game and a game that everybody has fond memories of enough that it should if there's going to be another Final Fantasy entry it should be that it yeah. should be Tactics. Um, and then my final pick is actually two games: Silent Hill One and Two. Well, Silent Hill Two is on uh, PlayStation Two. Yeah. All oh, right. Right. Or wait, no, Silent Hill Two is a PlayStation. PlayStation game. Two. Promise you. Wow. Silent Hill One was the I only. I thought game. for sure it was PlayStation One. Nope. Well then, Silent Hill. Yeah, Silent Hill's a good inclusion. But again, Konami. Konami, analog stick. (laughs) Again, might be remade. Might be, yeah. (laughs) That would be a really good idea to remake the first Silent Hill. Except when they remastered them, they were garbage. They were. uh, I don't know if I trust that. But no, I think Silent Hill, actually, I replayed that about five, six years ago, and it still more or less holds up, except for the fact that you can't tell what anything's supposed to be. <laughs> you can't. Cause it's very I mean, that's kind of true of, like, the PlayStation. I mean, I said back, at the, back in the day, I remember saying, like, Usenet and stuff, like, the games that come out now are going to, like, age terribly because they look like shit. Like, they, yeah. it's the first 3D generation. Everyone's figuring stuff out. It looks awful. No one has fingers. Like, yeah. And I would get roasted for that. Like, I was like, no, everything looks amazing. It's like, no, it doesn't. It's not <laughs> going to look amazing for another five minutes. Like, it's going to be done. Well, I remember I used to, like, go over to other people's houses. And some of my friends had a lot of consoles. Some of them would just have one. They'd have, One would have, like, mm-hmm. just the N64. Some would just have the PlayStation 1. And I remember I go and sit and like play games with them, and I would like laugh at the graphics on PlayStation. Like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, look at like the textures and like the polygons, just like all shivering mm-hmm. and shaking around. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm oh, like, see that? Up. Look at it moving. Buckle up, because intentionally doing that is the next big indie game graphical trend. I promise you, <laughs> it's already starting to happen. <laughs> wait, are you joking or no, no? I'm not joking. What? It's already starting. But wait, wait and see. Next year, you're gonna start seeing. PlayStation 1 style indie game graphics. We have that one YouTube channel called Which Night. I think is silly because like Super Nintendo it's style, ridiculous. I get it and because that's so that's, that's a that's a lot it's an art style. So it looks cool. You can do that. But like that's just a 
technological limitation. That's not. Yeah. A, it's like it wasn't the, an art style. It's like it wasn't a choice. It's like the pre-rendered backgrounds in the Resident Evil games. It's like yeah. no, that was a limitation. That was yeah. a workaround. They didn't it's not, do it's that not a, because they wanted it. That's that not way. a cool thing. It always was. <laughs> I never liked that. I thought that's why Silent Hill's so great. Is it was a full 3D. It game. was all moved the camera through the environment. It was yeah. great. Yeah. So I got my own. I mean, I said so I could answer. That's insane, too. though. I've not yeah. seen an indie game that does that. Well, it's not yet. Just wait for it. It's uh, coming. I oh, promise. you're predicting it. I'm predicting. Oh, okay. That's what I was trying to get at. I'm predicting it also in the sense that I've seen a couple of them, and I get which just just stay tuned, Norm. It's coming. <laughs> I think it's ridiculous, but it's coming. Well, there's the one YouTube channel that we curate stuff from called 98 D Make. Oh, that's where fun too. Yeah, I love that yeah. that channel because it takes like modern games and like retro makes them right. into. And he does that. Like, he'll have the flickering, like, shaking textures mm-hmm. and, like, the polygons that, like, bend and, like... He's, he, he has a really good idea. This is actually one of my... I don't know it would never make it onto the collection, but this is actually one of my favorite PlayStation 1 games. Is that Destruction, Destruction Derby? Destruction Derby. I wouldn't count it completely out because it is a very well-regarded game now. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It's brought up... I see it brought up all the time in favorite PlayStation 1 threads and tweet, Twitter threads and stuff. It, it, it's just one of those things where it just so happened that at launch when I got the PlayStation, there wasn't that much. I think, I think this or Driver, like a, a Reflections game should probably make it. Yeah. I played the living crap out of this game. It's so funny to look at it now. I would, so I would say... Um, <laughs> look at those trees. It's so awesome. <laughs> look at the aliasing on the railing around the... Mm-hmm. It's just... Wow. 360. Yeah. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to buy this, and they're going to take it home and plug it in and be like, What, what? the yeah, it's, mm. heck is this? What did I spend $100 I on mean, this? I mean, my, my picks would be like Wipeout. XL or 2097 in Europe, um, but I don't think it'll make it because the music licensing is going to kill it. Yeah, there's a lot of music licensing issues on a lot of these games. That why- was a question and factor factor this week about like why do developers put licensed music in their games, knowing that eventually they're going to expire and on down the road they're not going to be able to sell them. Well, in this case, because the music, the soundtrack of Wipeout XL is one of the greatest soundtracks ever put on oh, yeah. anything. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons the game is awesome. Yeah. But you're not going to, like, Sony is clearly not going to go back and relicense the Prodigy and Chemical Brothers for this freaking quick buck classics release. But the funny thing is, is they could and they should because they should. they're going to yeah. make more than enough money off of this to afford those. Like, and you know what? Like, Chemical Brothers probably would be like, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. they don't care. They're not, like, money-grubbing, like, corporate types. They're just a bunch of ex-ravers who've made some great music. Like, I think they could work with Chemical yeah. Brothers. Maybe some of the other guys, not so much, but... Like, look, if Firestarter isn't on here, I don't want to play it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. But, like, it's, um, all, all the games I would think of are either weird inclusions because I like them or, like, they're essential, like, historical marker, like, um... Uh... A Twisted Metal game should be on yeah, there. It should, I don't right. like Twisted Metal, but Twisted should Metal be should there. be on there. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, Colony Wars. I'll put, I'll put Colony Wars on there just because I love Colony Wars. Uh, no one cares, but it should be on there. Uh, Gran Turismo should be on there. One of the Gran Turismos. But it's like, are they going to relicense you know, Garbage, my favorite game, for uh, Gran Turismo 2? No. You know what really blows all my mind car, about Wipeout right again? there was the Red Bull billboards. Yep. I didn't even know Red Bull had come to the U.S. at that point. It was unusual at the time. I remember because that. I remember <laughs> when I started working at GameSpot in 2000, Red Bull had just become a thing. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, it was such a thing that I remember Ryan Davis. This is crazy. Ryan Davis ordered cases of Red Bull from like Taiwan hmm. or maybe Thailand. I can't remember where it started. Whatever country it started in, he ordered cases of Red Bull from there because it was such a big deal. And when they showed up, they weren't the westernized Red Bull with carbonated. They were these little black bottles that looked like medicine bottles. Yeah. And you literally unscrewed the cap off the top of them, and it was only like maybe three ounces. And oh my God, dude. Literally, you drank that, and like 30 minutes later, you were holding on to like for sanity. <laughs> like I literally, I, I felt like I had taken like, I drank like five gallons of coffee. Oh yeah, they used, I remember that when they started doing like that twenty-four hour energy thing and all that, shit. three hour energy or whatever. Yeah, well, that's basically they just basically were taking what, was, what the yeah. original Red Bull was. Yeah, because yeah. Red Bull when it started is not what you think it is. No, now. it was like a little shot of like, it was like an elixir, hyper caffeine and stuff. Yeah. yeah, 
But I mean, it still had like the taurine in it or whatever. Yeah. It wasn't just caffeine. Well, that's where the Red Bull name comes from. But he bought a whole case of that and we had it in there. It took us like eight months to drink <laughs> it because it's like you drink it and you'd be like, oh my gosh, I, I may have a heart attack. Like, no, we knew, because um, I, I played this a lot with uh, Miguel Concepcion at the time and uh, he liked it. He got into it because he was big into Britpop and... Um, uh, uh, you know, elect- electronic, electronic music, music yeah. and trance and stuff like that. And this was a lot of the up and comers at the time. Like no one knew. Like people would come over and like we'd be playing this, and people would be like, "What is that song?" Like they, they, they like people would get into like Chemical Brothers off of listening to the Wipeout soundtrack. What people don't and, realize about the PlayStation is that, first of all, when it launched, it did not do well at launch at all, and they marketed it to the underground. So my buddy in Philadelphia, he had a weekly club night called Yo Man appropriate for Philly. And it was like every Thursday night, I think it was. And nobody I knew owned a PlayStation. And then they signed a deal with my buddy to come into his club night for like three weeks or four weeks straight and set up kiosks in the club. And basically the only thing that was on there was Wipeout. And the reason they played Wipeout is because it was all electronic Mm -hmm. music. And obviously it was like a house music club or whatever. And Within that four-week period, every single one of my friends eventually bought a PlayStation. Hmm. And that's kind of how their marketing plan was from the beginning. They're like, hey, we're going to go to do this underground stuff. We're going to try to build groundswell. Obviously, it paid off in spades. They were geniuses for doing it. But Wipeout was a big game for PlayStation out of the gate because of how they decided to market the console like right away. And the music is me. I like Wipeout in general, but the music in that made that game way more epic. I remember like there were some close races that... like. Wouldn't have been as adrenaline pumping without Atom Bomb by Fluke playing yeah, behind yeah. it. Um, so yeah, that would be, that would be like if you're talking about like games that I think absolutely necessarily have to be on it. That would be like number three or four yeah, on my list, I agree. and it's never going to be. Yeah, and it's, it's a double strategy because it would play fine without the analog stick because yep. it predated the analog stick. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we played that a lot. And um, I, I never thought they quite matched that again. Uh, Wipeout Three was good, but it wasn't it wasn't that. Um, so let's let's rank the micro consoles, Matt. There are so many. Mm-hmm. So let's. Where do you find yourself putting the PlayStation Classic in the pantheon of micro consoles? Like, do you are you more into it than like the Neo Geo Mini or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm more into it than that. I'm more into it than the NES. Really? Um, oh wow. NES for a NES stuff like. NES stuff didn't really set my world on fire, even in the time I didn't own one, but. My friend did, and I played almost everything he ever rented, and it was good. But I, yeah, you know, I don't have any kind of real, like, no. oh my god, attachment to them. And all the good stuff on the NES has been available via virtual console for like yeah, eleven years. Forever, like, yeah. it, I, I don't feel like the NES Classic brought back anything I've been missing for years because it's so, it's so readily available on Nintendo systems. Uh, Super Nint- Super NES Classic is my number one. Um, of all the all the retro consoles, I because agree with it, that. because it the the selection is incredible. There's tons of games on it. There's almost nothing missing that I would say is like completely essential to the system, and it all looks great on a modern TV. Like that is, that's all I ask. Um, also, they actually had enough stock for most of the people that want to want to get one, yep. which is doubly doubly nice. Um, so yeah, I uh, so you would go I would SNES. PlayStation Classic? I don't. I can't rank the PlayStation Classic until I see what, yeah, what else is on lineup. it. Yeah, the whole lineup. Yeah. Like, like I, I, I mean, the lack of analog sticks probably drops it to the bottom almost at this point. I mean, I can absolutely rank it because I know what the possible games are that could come to it, and knowing that for me, the PlayStation Classic is way down. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I agree. SNES best micro console. I'd have NES at second. I would have the Neo Geo before PlayStation One. I know some people may think that's crazy, but those games still hold up because they're yeah, well, 2D games. This is an anomaly. This is like very crude 3D tech in 2018. Yeah, well, that's kind of why I think you should, you know, if I were put, you know making the compilation, I would be also mixing in some 2D stuff right. that holds up. You know, exactly. You trying to get the Lunar games in there or something, yeah. or at least one of the Lunar games. Um, I don't there was know, a lot of 2D I don't even know what the rights around that would be now that working designs doesn't exist. Um, it's different when you make a micro console for 3D games, and I think Nintendo's going to run into this whenever it finally puts out the N64 Classic mm-hmm. or whatever. It's different with 3D. Like, we have... We don't have better versions of 2D games now, necessarily. There probably are some examples that are better than the classics from the 2D era, but that's debatable. Mm-hmm. What's not debatable is that there are much better 3D games in the same style, in the same genre now, 
And to go back and, like, I don't want to play Tekken 3. I'll play Tekken 7. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. The allure for me for the, and I'm sure it's sold out everywhere and people are going to, you know, sell it on eBay and make a million dollars off each one. I, I don't really care. I have very, very little interest in this. Tekken um, has always looked terrible. Like, I just can't get over how bad Tekken has always been. <laughs> I, I played it a lot because it's all I we did, had. I, mean, I just think but... all the games on this do. Like, I, I'm i sure the PC version of Final Fantasy VII is way better, and probably the Switch version of Final Fantasy VII is going to be way better than what you're going to get on this. I just, mm. I just don't see the appeal of it at all. One way or the other, they ain't going to have fingers, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I just, it, I, I, I think I would have, I would be more positive on it if they were providing an actual dual analog controller. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, that would help. Which at the very least would give me hope for the remaining 15 right. games to be right. from a wider breadth of the library. Yeah. Uh, but it, <laughs> Look you, at that. Yeah. Come back and pause that. Look at LOL's face. Law yeah, versus Law, Law is a very special <laughs> yeah. example. You need more polygons to do Bruce Lee, turns out. It's not even that. It's the facial expression. <laughs> it's like, who signed off on that? Who was like, yeah, that's the still we're going to use for his character select. <laughs> Freaking great. I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I fail to see And this was Tekken 3. Like yeah. they'd done two previously. T- two was like two was probably the one I played the most, actually. I mean, I'm sure part of it is that I was already a semi adult when the PlayStation came out. Yeah. If this was like the console that was available when I was like seven or eight years old, I would probably be way more nostalgic for it than I am now. But I don't know. Sure, but it's also like, you know, stuff like this is why like even the bad games today look like miracles to me. Oh yeah. You know, like <laughs> seriously. So I remember when you couldn't tell what was a hand and what was a rock. Yeah. So you said you got one already. How uh, did you How did you get yours? Uh, I think it was GameStop. Yeah. Uh, the, Are all the pre-orders sold out now for people who may be interested in getting one? I don't know. I haven't been paying attention. They, they went up sporadically. I, I know Amazon's Because it went up first on fast. Amazon. No, nah, it went up first on GameStop. On GameStop, yeah. And I thought maybe Amazon hadn't even put them up for sale yet the last time I Amazon looked. did, but they were gone instantly. And so now yeah. you can only get them from, like, you can do the, like, email me two days after you get them again and it's too late already. Thing. I'm so sick of that crap. Um, I'm so sick of not being able to buy something I want to buy. Yeah, well, you don't know. I don't even want to buy this. I don't even want to buy this. Yeah, like, I don't. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what the rest of the games are. If, it, if it's just, like, a cavalcade of, like, first-year PlayStation crap, I'll probably, like, cancel it or give it away or sell it or something i don't know but like if you want it i guess we'll say what we always say if people are trying to find something that's hard to get follow wario 64 on yeah. twitter and he will literally the minute i mean the bro the problem is everybody's figured that out now because i did that to try to get the ps4 pro the the big anniversary edition the mm-hmm. blue translucent one and i was following him like the night is supposed to go on and i still couldn't get one like, yeah. it just well, is were, impossible. There weren't too many of those. Uh, apparently, I don't know. Was it 50,000 or 500,000? Yeah, 50. And I, I just think that they're even following him, there's no guarantee you're going to get it. No, and well, you, you're going to be that. like me, who sits there on Twitter for like four hours, like wait, waiting for each new retailer to pop up, and then the new one pops up, and by the time you go there, it's just, they're gone. Yeah, like, well, that's or how the, I got mine. Or the website's crashed, or... That's yeah. how I got mine. Was he? Was, I mean, I w- there was no rush on it. From I heard about it, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I saw that he had, he had tweeted about, oh, it's up on GameStop. And then like, I mean, hours later when I got home, I'm like, oh, where's that tweet? You still I got it. it. I still got it. Yeah, it was. Wow. It was not. It was not some. Cr- I mean, part of that might just be because people don't like buying from GameStop. That could be. But, uh, you know, because the shipping's not free. Yeah. But uh, I decided just to get it, so I had it. And if I can replace it with an Amazon order, I'll cancel it and switch to the Amazon order. And yeah. If uh, the, the full lineup comes out and I decide I don't like what I see, I can always just cancel. Or I'm sure there's people who'd be more than willing to buy it from you. Yeah, who but it's easier it. to just cancel it. Nope. That way I don't <laughs> you don't want to deal with all that crap. No. That's for sure. All right, so there you go. PlayStation Classic, December 3rd, $100. Matt's bought it. I'm not going to buy it. If you want to buy, buy it, I bought it luck. in preparation for the rush. I'm, I'm just, in case I end up actually wanting it, I'll... I'll I have it if I need it. And if the rest of the games are blah, then I'll just get rid of it. All right. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about YouTube, something we haven't talked about in quite a while. Some of you may have noticed that 
Well, let's 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 rewind a little bit. Let's go back to when YouTube gaming started and let's talk about what YouTube gaming is. So YouTube gaming is an umbrella for a lot of things at YouTube, but primarily it was the moniker used for its competitor to Twitch, mm -hmm. which is your ability to live stream gameplay on YouTube. I think when it launched, and I know we talked about it when it launched because we have this B-roll sitting on the TriCaster, I think when it launched, I think we we were, I think we were optimistic that it might be able to make a dent in Twitch. I wasn't. You weren't. No. Twitch was Twitch has too much uh, critical mass. It was but, it was not a. I mean, you could. I didn't. I didn't doubt that maybe you could run a parallel thing, but like the idea of like catching them or making any any kind of like headway against them is silly. Like they're too big now. Are they too big then? But I think YouTube is and was back then bigger. Yeah, but it's not what people use it for. Like it's, it's the perception of what you use YouTube for. Like the idea of using YouTube for streaming was too weird back then. And I think YouTube streaming is more or less functional now. Like people do it, but like people associate Twitch with live and they associate YouTube with pre-produced. Like that you're not going to get away from that anytime soon. That's something that bothers me in our current society is that we we have this stay in your lane society where like once you establish something as something if you ever try to go outside of whatever people have perceived that thing to be it's a problem it's a bad decision it's a mistake it's and people will actively rebel against it just because a company or a service tries something new they're like oh no 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 i get that over here and that's where i'm gonna keep mm -hmm. it i think we've run into that a little bit with sifted in all honesty I think a lot of people are just kind of settled in their ways of gathering gaming news. I've, I've seen it a lot when people talk about Sifted, like, ah, I just use an RSS. It's like, really? You're going to use a freaking RSS feed? Like, you know, obviously I go on all the websites every day. I think Sifted is the best way to get gaming news. But a lot of people just have their habits. They go to a message board or they use an RSS reader or some RSS feed that they've mm -hmm. set up themselves. It's very hard to get people to break out of their routines. That's just the way it is. Some people just use YouTube for gaming news. Yeah. And I guess I don't know how you do that, but some people do. And they're, if they're happy, I guess that's all that matters. But it, it's just very weird how once people perceive something to be X, if you try to make it Y, it just seems like it's never going to work. No matter how good that Y is, it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the streaming on YouTube, honestly, is better. Like if we're like on, uh, let's say, for example, during E3. When we when we're doing like our our live like commentary over press conferences, we use YouTube because the streams look better. They're clearer. They're they don't stutter as much. We almost always end up using YouTube. It doesn't crash as often because they have servers out the yin yang. But ultimately, I don't think a better service guarantees success anymore. Yeah, I mean, see, I it would never it never even occurs to me to watch streaming stuff on YouTube. Really. I watch everything. See, I, I see watch it on, all the time because everything like, I watch is on Twitch. Our admin pulls in all the live streams, so we see it all. Mm -hmm. So it's just a daily thing that I experience. And honestly, like until they until they announced they were shutting YouTube Gaming down, I forgot YouTube Gaming was a thing. Really interesting. Which is probably part of the reason. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel the same way I as you do. But personally, like if I if I'm gonna watch a stream and I know something streaming both on YouTube and on Twitch, I watch it on YouTube because for me at least. My, my viewing experience has been better on YouTube. It doesn't stutter as much. It doesn't buffer as much. Uh, the bit rate seems higher. It seemed higher to me on YouTube. And here's the thing. YouTube is not... You, you can still stream games on YouTube. They're not taking the feature away. They've just stopped sort of having it as an official part of their business. And I'm sure all the money that YouTube had invested in, in it, all the capital expenditures, that's probably all going away. All the original content that YouTube first started working on with YouTubers, mm -hmm. that stuff's been gone for a while. Um, somebody, was it last week uh, during Q&A, somebody asked us about uh, Keeley's show? Yeah. Yeah. Ironic, right? Yeah. <laughs> somebody brought that up Fine last timing. week. timing. Yeah, the timing was impeccable. I um, mean, and, and Keeley's show hasn't been on forever. Like maybe like a year or something like that. Sam's getting a laugh Sam, out of this. Sam, Sam's giggling at uh, <laughs> Mount Your Friends there. Um, 
So what do you think happened, Matt? You think that's what it was? It's just like people don't expect to watch live gaming on YouTube and therefore just never gave it a chance? I think it's part of it, and part of it was just like lack of messaging, that it was a thing, and that it was a any kind of unified movement there. I think you, you ran into the same problem with Facebook Watch, if you even knew that was a thing, which is, you know, it's, Facebook Watch was like produced content of just about every subject matter you can imagine, but it's like, you know, like, a, like YouTube for Facebook. And uh, it kind of came out, and no one noticed, and that was that. Like, I think part of the problem is that they did not do enough shoulder marketing. So let's say you're watching Keeley Show. What was it called? Like Live on YouTube or something like that? I can't remember yeah, what it Games was. Yeah, Games Live on YouTube. So something, something like it that. Was not, a, not an eye catcher, yeah. really. But when you watch that, they never talked about streaming games on YouTube. Right. I mean, and that's really what the crux of the whole thing was. They really made those shows to just kind of get people into the environment because the show was streamed live. And uh, they never used that to leverage people into their live streaming. Like, before we came to do the show today, I just popped over to YouTube Gaming because it's still there. And they have, like, the top 10 most popular streams right now. No, by the time you got to number seven, there were 500 people watching the stream. It was called Live with YouTube Gaming? Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> what it was, yeah. Okay. Right. But they never talked about, like, hey, this is a streaming service. Right. They never showed off the features of stuff that they could do only on YouTube's live streaming platform that you couldn't do on Twitch. They never did what they sh were supposed to do, which is promote the service while they created content. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that would have made the show any better to watch, but it would made at least people would have been aware that it existed. Yeah, it was an awareness issue. Ab absolutely. And it's also like, you know, it's the same problem with like Facebook Watch and, and it's like, why don't I use Facebook for that? You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's it, like Periscope. It, it's a stay in your lane thing, I suppose, but it's also like people use different things for different purposes and they don't always want to use them for that other, you know, convergence was not the magic bullet everybody thought it was. You know, it, it's yeah. like, oh, we do, all we need to do is make our platform do everything. Well, it turns out people don't really want a platform that does everything. They want a platform that does one thing well. And yeah. you got, I don't think you can argue that, like, you know, did Twitch, did, does YouTube do streaming better than Twitch? Maybe, but Twitch, is, does I think, does a better job of, like, throwing, like, a mass amount of content at you and making you feel like I have all this stuff to choose from, and you know, and I can pick anything I want. And like, you know, YouTube Gaming is no slouch in terms of like, you know, the streaming content available. But I think it's just it. Sometimes a head start matters, and in this case, uh, Twitch was so far ahead, it was just not feasible to break that mentality of like, where do I watch streaming video game content? I watch that on Twitch. Here's one thing I should bring up that I completely overlooked because I'm not that person. Is that the viewer's experience, if you want to engage, is way better on Twitch. Mm -hmm. YouTube was always playing catch up in that regard. Like when I watch streams, I don't really go in the chat and like mm -hmm. use like crazy emo and all that stuff, like emoji. I don't no, do any of that. You know, you subscribe. I literally this, watch like, yeah. it. I don't do any of that. I watch, I pop it full screen and I sit back and watch. But a lot of people who use Twitch, that's not how they use it. They yeah. use it. They're, they have bits, and they're ready to award bits to the, the streamers and blah, blah, blah. That is one area where YouTube was mm -hmm. always behind. And so for my purposes, YouTube was better, because all I cared about was stream quality, the video quality. But if you want to engage with the streamer, Twitch is way better for that. Yeah, the social experience of Twitch, like YouTube was never able to match that. Absolutely. And that, that probably is what really killed... I think that's where you YouTube. you lose the interest of the core audience, even if they have heard of you. You're also losing the revenue because people are paying for the bits mm. to reward the streamers, and we even we get bits sometimes during Game Face, which is freaking awesome. And you, I think YouTube had just like implemented that like a month or two ago, something like that, and now I don't even know why. Like <laughs> it's like too late. You should have known two months ago that everything was not going to work out or whatever. So. Um, do you think, we know obviously Keeley Show hasn't been around for probably like a couple of years at this point. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they'll still do E3 coverage the way that uh, they've done for the last several years? I don't know. That's a lot of money for not a lot of return. It is a lot of money. I mean, that's the other thing too. Like if you go to E3 and you're on the show floor, you can walk around, you can see all the stages. You can see IGN stage, mm -hmm. you can see GameSpot stage, you can see Twitch. And then you come to YouTube gaming stage. And holy moly, like it is three times the size yeah. of any other it's the it's the G4 live show of, it is. of the modern it's the new E3. the new version of it absolutely 
And, they might uh, even be in the same place. I mean, like I went on there one year, Screw Attack had like a segment and they brought me on to talk about some stuff. And like, I, it was like being back at G4 or mm -hmm. being at Spike because you walk in, they have like 30 people with headsets on, like all talking to each other and they're like grabbing you by the arm and like dragging you places. And it's like, wow, this is insane. Like literally there were more people working in the booth than there were people standing around watching the con things happen. Yeah, that is a way problem. more, way more. And that's usually a good sign that, yeah, you're probably whatever you're working on is not working out the yeah. way that you had hoped. Or, I mean, we, you know, we had uh, hired audience people a lot of the times and stuff like that, because again, like you're the problem with E3 for something like that is you aren't, you don't just have random people. You're not now you do, but like back then it was all industry people. Yeah. And industry people usually have something better to do than stand there and watch a TV show being filmed. You well, know, you'd like have, have other places the to little be. mini I, to entourage to. of people that would come with the developer to, yeah. to take him there and talk to you and tell you that he likes this, he doesn't like that, he can talk about this, he can't talk about that, or she can or she can't. But that was it. Like, we, like when we first did live at uh, E3 for GT, we just took whatever we could get. And we ended up with a stage right next to the Starbucks in the food court. Yeah. Seriously. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. We had that stage like right there. That was like the first year that we did it. And like literally, like if there were nobody in line at Starbucks, like we were just broadcasting by ourselves. Like there was just <laughs> nobody paying attention. Well, luckily there's always someone in line at Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. Right? But, uh, but yeah, so do you think that they'll keep doing that? Because there's value beyond know, just it, supporting. I think it depends how good, good a game Keeley can talk at them. Yeah. Keeley can convince him to keep doing it, sure, but like I don't know if that's. And something... at this point, he has like the E3 Coliseum stuff he's doing. Yeah, like, I don't know. He may not even care that much. About I don't know it if anymore. he cares. I don't know if I certainly don't think YouTube cares that much. Yeah. So. I mean, what, what I was getting at is their production was expensive. Yeah. Like they had a jib and like I mean, getting a jib in there that's a big freaking deal. But that's how big their stage was that they needed a jib to do like sweeping shots and things like yeah. that. So. Uh, they were spending a ton of money sponsorship wise like i don't remember seeing a lot of sponsors like signage know. and stuff there i just remember the youtube red everywhere yeah just promoting like their pay service or whatever mm -hmm. so um do you think anyone's gonna miss youtube gaming i wouldn't have if he hadn't said anything so <laughs> yeah no i mean it's, i know i'm not the target audience i'm too old but like uh, it's not a thing I used. It's not a thing I thought about. It's not a thing I really remembered was a thing. And after seeing this, what about services like Mixer and things like that? I mean, are they just all doomed to fail? If YouTube can't do it... I mean, I think... Yeah, I think it's just an also-ran thing I mean, Mixer, well. obviously, they feed directly from everyone's consoles into right. Mixer, if you want. I mean, that's just as long as Microsoft feels like supporting it, it'll be there. But so was YouTube Gaming, really. right? Yeah, and I'm wondering if Mixer isn't long for this world. I don't know. Either. I think Mixer will get another... Mixer will get its uh, big chance with the next Xbox, I think. I think the next Xbox will launch with some kind of, you know, super Mixer integrated features and they'll try to make it even more part of the whole OS and experience and it'll mostly be interfering and annoying and people won't use it and then it'll, it'll go away after, like, three major updates. Cause, I mean, that but was like, a big... Remember, that was a big thing with them, like, with the Xbox One. Right was having all that integrated streaming and game capture and all that stuff built right. into it. Like some, of it's, some of it's cool. Like, I don't have the Kinect hooked up anymore, but it was early on it was fun to be like, Xbox, record that, and like getting the stuff. I still do that on. to record glitches. Yeah, I don't... I, I, I never... I put the Kinect away a long time Did ago. You? I mean, I, I do that on both places. Like, I was, finished, I was on the final boss of Spider-Man, and it glitched out. Mm -hmm. Literally, the boss just went dead. He just stood there. And I could run around him, and he just was completely deactivated. And I captured that. Like, I captured mm -hmm. goofy stuff like that, because a lot of times you tell people that stuff like that happened to you in a game, and they're like, no, I don't believe you. So for whatever reason, like, I end up recording that stuff. And then ultimately, I end up mm -hmm. deleting it without anyone ever looking at it. I love so. recordings like that of Mass Effect Andromeda. Yeah. Like, just goofy stuff. People end up, you know, characters starting in the T position, but still animated. Yeah. And so, like, they're like, whacking each other. Yeah, I'm the assuming you got that that way. Yep. Um, yeah, every once in a while I use it, but it's not something I use constantly. And Do you I think at this point it's just really hard or almost impossible to create some kind of new gaming service? In terms of streaming, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Twitch is already what it is. I mean, do you think, let's say somebody came into the space and made something that just hands down is like way better than Twitch. Do you think it would succeed? I don't know. How is it better than Twitch? 
I guess that that's relevant. Yeah. Just let's say every way it's better. Like the fan engagement's better, the streams are better. What if a service came in and it had 4K streams for the first time, and all the other parts of the service were better or at least equal to Twitch? Do you think it would even succeed? Or is it just too late? I think it's too late. I think it would partly depend on which streamers on Twitch migrated to the new service, because um, that's that's the key: is who you're watching yeah. more than what you're watching. Yeah. Um, no, you're right. And maybe I, maybe what YouTube needed basically to do. you needed to make something that the that the popu- most popular streamers would embrace, and I know they did try to do that with something. But it's like you know they try to make a lot of YouTubers translate to streaming, which doesn't always work. But don't you remember Twitch played um, hardball, and they said, okay, anyone who's a partner with us, you need to read the fine print right. in your contract. You cannot go stream on YouTube. Mm-hmm. That was that probably had a pretty big impact yeah, on it. But that's like any even if your your actual technology is better than Twitch. You have to find a way to end run around the fact that Twitch likes to lock those people in. Like, you need yeah. to go find a way to, like, okay, if you break your contract with Twitch, we'll get guarantee you three years of, you know, you basically... Becomes, or we'll pay any fines they levy it becomes and the N- we'll give you this. It becomes the NFL draft. Which, honestly, it probably should be that way. I mean, that's probably what YouTube should have mm-hmm. done. It should have taken... It should have just said, look, let's bite the bullet. We'll spend some money in our budget, and we're just going to buy these people away. We'll mm-hmm. pay... Whatever we have to pay to get them out of their contract with Twitch, and then we'll set them up with big salaries to work on YouTube. They didn't do it. I think the another problem, and I should have brought this up earlier, is YouTube's copyright stuff. Mm-hmm. The strikes. Like, I don't get strikes on Twitch for anything. Like, you go on Twitch, there are people streaming, sitting there, playing licensed music yep. all night. Yep. It's not one track. It's literally, like three hours of licensed music and that stuff goes up on vod and they serve ads against it no problem yep and then you have youtube which is literally just brutal for copyright protection i mean probably 80 percent of the strikes we get are absolutely fair use like if we actually went through the process and disputed it we probably would rule in our favor but it it takes them like three weeks Hmm. to rule on each one of those by then your views are done nobody cares at that point and so i think honestly that is one of the bigger issues with youtube that kept people from going there to stream knowing that they could not monetize that content beyond or just not or just not wanting to be involved with the company that does that yep you're right yeah you're right i mean look i I don't have a problem with YouTube protecting content at sure. all. In fact, it's something YouTube should have been doing from the beginning. But there's always nuance. There needs to be a better process in place to dispute it. Like, if I dispute something that's fair use, like, I should get an answer in 24 hours. Yeah. Period. Well, also, like, they there should be a little bit of uh, watchdogging of the companies that kind of abuse that. You know, like, Nintendo probably should be called out no, you're right. by them. It's like, hey, like, use it for, you know, real things. But, like, if someone's running your frickin' trailer... Sit yep. down. Yeah. Like you know, like stop it. Like it's it's a weird it's a weird nebulous system that does not seem to favor the, the creator. And um you know, certainly like people shouldn't be allowed to like, you know, exploit that, but like I feel like the the, the publishers and the corporations do exploit it and there's no avenue for the users to get around that. And, oh yeah, I get random strikes. I get strikes sometimes for... And Twitch, on the other hand, is just like, it's the Wild West out there, and so far nothing, you know, we'll, I mean, we'll see how the Twitch Prime advertising thing turns out, uh, if they're going to put ads back in for that. Yeah. But um, I, I don't... Twitch seems pretty bulletproof right now, unless somebody wants to just throw money at the problem until they win, which is, uh, to be fair, how the PlayStation 1 pulled it off. No, you're right. So. Yeah. It, it worked for them, but... <laughs> Two different, that's apples and oranges, I yeah, think, a little but bit. But it is an example of, like, here's this giant monolithic thing that we don't think we can, you know, you can't, it's dug in like a tick. Uh, how do we deal with that? Well, we throw money at the most popular things that make that worth it and put it on our thing. And PlayStation also had the advantage of, a te- you know, a technological leap. You know, it had, it yeah. had real music. It had uh, CD quality stuff. It had, you know, like you said, like, you know, you couldn't have done Wipeout. XL on the N64 because yeah. it didn't have CD audio. Yeah. And, um, you know, so if you're talking about, like, oh, a, a, a competitor to Twitch has a technological leap, it does everything better, um, how do we do this? Take a page out of Sony's book, throw money at, at, the, at the key reasons people go to Twitch until they come to your thing. Yeah. I don't think anybody's got the interest or money to do that right now, though. I think if there are any companies that could bring down Twitch for copyright stuff, it might be music streaming services like Spotify 
mm -hmm. and things like that. But because the, the the artists aren't going to care, yeah, no one's gonna be like, well, I want Ninja right. to play my track. Right. You know, well, I, I they don't make want their, they make their money on at the concerts. Yeah, it's like I don't I don't want Ninja to not want to play my track. I want him to play it. Mm -hmm. um, if he's streaming to five hundred thousand people tonight, yes, please play my track. It's the the industries that are incentivized to protect music that could potentially mm -hmm. come in and raise a stink. But well, the well, artists protect are do it. protect the way they've always made money from music. Right. Like that's the that's who's hanging on to that is like it's not the people that make the music, it's the people that profit from the people who make the music. Right, right. So um it just seems like that's a legal battle that nobody wants to have yet. Yeah. Um, it'll happen someday. It'll happen. Like there'll be, the dam will break at some point, but I don't know what I don't know what that'll be. Like something I don't know what would have to happen for that. You know, and little things pop up and then get you know, like turntable FM and stuff. Like yeah. that was a pretty cool idea, but that got squashed real fast. Um, I found a lot of, uh, but that's the irony of it is like, uh, turntable.fm was like, you know, if, if, you have, if people didn't know what that was, it was like a, you, you went on and like, it was like you had like these little virtual DJ rooms and everybody could take turns playing a song yep. in the room. And I found so much new music in there that I would then go like buy from iTunes or Amoeba right. Music. Yeah. Like I, you know, I went and actually bought the music. It's not yeah. like I went and like Napstered it or some stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, like this. Well, there is no Napster. No, anymore. there was no Napster at that point. <laughs> but like it was like, uh, you know, it wasn't like a thing where like you suddenly just stole the music. It was like, no, I went and bought that because like, oh, I really like that song. Oh, I found a new artist. I mean, it's, I spent a lot of money and, and people made a lot of money off me from finding them on that turntable service. Funny and now, how that works. Mm, now it's gone. gone. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think anyone's going to miss YouTube gaming. Probably not. I mean, do you even, we even miss the E3 stuff? Because... I never watched the E3 stuff. I was here. Uh, you don't have to, though, <laughs> because you can watch five or six other live streams and it's just the same crap mm -hmm. on every single one of them. Are we going to miss an extra one? Probably not. No. I mean, if I was going to watch anything live when I wasn't on here live, it would probably be Keeley's thing. Yeah. Um, which was... Was that YouTube? Probably. Related. It was like, I don't it was even know all... if they, I don't think they even broadcasted, to be honest. That was like, I think that was, I feel like that was later or earlier. It was only like the press conference days. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what he did with YouTube. But for and the then rest he started of the... doing the Coliseum stuff. Yeah, then the that. Coliseum stuff went for the rest of the week. Like, that's yeah. what I would watch. They, I don't then. think they even stream that. No. Like, I think they leave it as an incentive for people to go to the Yeah, show. I wouldn't, like, I mean, I don't think I could have watched it because I was doing other things. Yeah. But like, yeah. it wouldn't probably be my choice for, for that. It wouldn't even occur to me. Well, I wouldn't think of it. I'd go watch, I don't know, I'd go watch Keely or Easy Allies or something. There's a lot of people that would, though, because it of Rooster Teeth and all those YouTubers. Like, yeah. they do get those people on there, and they probably don't go to, like, Twitch's stream or GameSpot mm -hmm. stream or well, IGN like, stream. Honestly, I you know, I mostly stick to the official stuff. Like, yeah. I, you know, I'll, I'll watch the stream of whoever's press conference is coming up, and... I'll watch either Nintendo or Sony streams during the show because, like, that's where you see the stuff that wasn't the in the access. press conference. Yep. They have the you access. Know, just about every third-party game worth anything is going to parade past the Sony live stream. Absolutely. So. Yep. All right. We'll put a bow on that. We're going to move on and talk about... What does back on the porch mean, by the way? Oh, if you can't run with the big dogs, oh, okay. get back on the porch. Okay. <laughs> and that's what YouTube tried to do. It tried to run with the big dogs. I was trying to figure out if like the porch was a pun on something related <laughs> to YouTube or something. I'm like, I couldn't put it together. It shocks me that more people do not ask me what the lower thirds are. <laughs> because sometimes, I mean, I intentionally create them so people are like, what the what? And people are just like, whatever. They just completely ignore them. So, hmm. yeah. So that's what that one meant. Feel free to ask away if you ever get confused by any of the lower thirds in Game Face, and I will thoroughly explain why I made them the way I did. Hmm. So, all right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Red Dead Redemption 2, a game that still most people have never seen being played. Think about this. We've seen an hour of Cyberpunk 2077, and we have yet to see a chunk of Red Dead Redemption 2 being played live. Yeah. Not any of it, but... It's Rockstar. They don't need to do shit. Yep, but the press... A week ago, got to go see the game and got to play the first two hours of the game. We're not allowed to capture any footage from the game again. Does that make you nervous? No, it's just Rockstar. I mean, it's Rockstar, Rockstar trying to exert its, contr its control. Doesn't make you nervous at all? No, it's just Rockstar being Rockstar. Yeah, I mean, if I think back, even with GTA 5, when I checked that out, couldn't capture footage. Mm-hmm. 
And it'll be like, yeah, we're going to put out 20 new screenshots. <laughs> Rockstar <laughs> keeps it. very tight control of any footage that goes out. Always has. Always have. Yeah. Um, we did get this trailer, though. So this trailer is six minutes of gameplay footage cut together. Uh, and they put this out on the day the embargo broke, and people were allowed to put their previews up. But let me tell you, they only, these people only played two hours, but the amount of information that was gleaned from that two hours of gameplay is staggering. Um, so I, I read a bunch of stuff, I watched a bunch of stuff, and then after I did that, I just jotted down the stuff that really stood out to me, and we're going to talk about it. So probably the biggest thing that was announced, and this made headlines all over the place, is the whole game is playable in first-person mode. Mm -hmm. um, I believe... GTA Five was had that at launch. Uh, the PlayStation Four and Xbox One versions did. Yeah. You, I don't think you could do it on the previous gen. Yeah, it does, but it doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. But people are making a gigantic deal out of it. Yeah. Um, um, did, or it's we, a neat trick, but I didn't use it more than like five minutes on GTA Five, and I don't expect to use it probably at all in this game unless there's a trophy for it. <laughs> yeah. Which is, I think, the only reason I did. GTA 5 that way. Why would you... Do you just have a thing where you just need to see the character on the screen? No, I just... Uh, uh, the Rockstar games tend to feel like they're designed to be played in third person, and I feel like these games... When you say, though, feel like they were designed to, mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means that you're supposed to have a, that wind-up of, of the animation starting for the run, and you're supposed to be able to see your character and how well they're behind cover. Um, you're supposed to be able to see around the corner for the cover, you know, like that kind of thing, and you can't do that in first person. Like, you can't, you know, first person automatically, if you're sticking your head out behind cover, you got to stick your head out. And sometimes that's a mechanic where you're automatically invincible. Yeah. But, like, you know, clearly they designed these games where, like, when you're behind cover, you're supposed to be able to see your character, move, you know, like Gears of War, move the, move the camera so you can see over the cover and see what people are doing. Um, I just, first person mode in, in GTA V was basically like a neat trick, but it was not yeah. a way to play the game, I don't think. But you know, with all the animation and, and work they put in, like the, how the characters move and what they wear and how that all works, why would I not want to look at that? Yeah, well, I, we'll start getting into some stuff. Like, you're right. There's uh, there are a lot of elements in this game that will make me want to play it in third person because there's so mm -hmm. much detail based upon what you do in the game and how you play the game on the character models, mm -hmm. on the horse models. Like, I'm not a huge like. I, I it has to be third person. It has to be first person. For I don't really care. Like, I'd rather shoot in first person, in all honesty, um, but you're right. When you deal with cover, a lot of times if the cover system's not good in first person, it's... Yeah, I don't care about... It's a I mean, disadvantage. It, I mean, the shooting doesn't matter first or third person. Like, it's... It, the, the bullet goes where the targeting reticle goes. Like, I don't care what's on the screen when that happens. But in terms of, like, being able to see the environment, see what my character's doing, if that's a factor... Like, most... You know, like, in Doom, it doesn't matter what my character's doing yeah. physically. Like, they're, you're just running around blowing shit up and punching demons in the face. Um, but in a, in a cover-based game, I tend to prefer to be able to see things from, from a wider, wider angle. It's the same thing with, like, Battlefront. Like, you have an advantage if you're playing in third person because you can look around cover better. No, you're right. You're um, absolutely right. I'm not saying... I hate playing it that way, though. I, I play it all the time <laughs> like that. Like, I, I hate it. I just, I just don't draw much of a comparison. And it's the same thing with, like, with like the Cyberpunk 277 thing where people are like, oh, I'm not going to buy this because it's in first person. Like, I don't understand that yeah, mentality. Because like, the whole game's set up to be played in first person. Yeah, if you design it to be played a certain way, I'm going to play it the way you want it to be played. That's usually how you get the best experience. And I can't imagine that Rockstar, you know, didn't design this game as it does most of his other, all of his other games around playing it in third person. But, you know, it's a pretty simple matter. Just move the camera into the, in the character's head and then say, yep. play it from that way. You know, so if, it's good to have the option because clearly people prefer one or the other. Um, but I'm, I'm almost certainly going to stick to third person unless there's some kind of, like, achievement where you're supposed to play for five minutes in first person or something right. like that. Or if there's some particular gameplay mechanic that I feel works better in first person. But I, haven't really, I don't really encounter that very often. This game is so gorgeous, by the way. Yeah, it looks Just great. watching this footage, it's just, wow. It is just stunning. Uh, let's start going through some of this stuff, though. Can't uh, wait for the PC version. They won't admit it exists. Yeah, but you know it's coming. Ray tracing. Uh, let's see. Some of the notes that people mentioned a lot was how funny the game is. Mm -hmm. The writing is very comedic. Um, the jokes are good, legitimately funny. Uh, does that fall in line with the way the first Red Dead was? It wasn't. There wasn't a whole lot of comic relief in that. No, Red Dead was pretty funny. I mean, or trying to be funny. I don't know if it pulled it off all the time. Um, but there, you know, uh, there were moments of Marston, levity. I mean, Marston was, you know, was a, had a little bit of a Geralt element to him, where he was just sort of 
bemused by everything. Um, all the strangers and freaks stuff were like pretty much comedic relief. You know, crazy yeah. people running around in the desert and all that stuff. Like the main storyline. I feel like was, a lot of the humor I got out of that game was unintentional. No, I think like either from a bug or just the way the cougars attacked and like the sound that no, they I made. I mean that's part of it. But I wouldn't say that. I, I, they, they keep it pretty light through the side quest stuff. Uh, the main quest, the main story of uh, of that was a little a little a little darker. But like, yeah, I didn't play a lot of the side stuff in. But all the, the strangers and freaks. I think every single strangers and freaks thing is basically some kind of weird, crazy person running around doing crazy stuff and Martian just being like, "All right, partner," you know, like, like yeah. Yeah, whatever, and like. <laughs> Yeah, the the main and every once in a while some funny stuff happens, like random peep things you run into on the road. Um, it was a pretty good balance. I didn't. I feel like there's a lot more uh, banter in this that wasn't part of the uh, the first game, which is fine. It's different, you know, different characters. It doesn't all have to be the same tone. Um, and Marston's quest was a little more uh, uh, a little more solo man, you know, man with no name coming back to town to to solve the problem so he can rest in peace, sort of thing. Whereas this is a bunch of bros in a outlaw gang, kind of like hanging out and doing their thing, so it kind of makes sense. There's a little more, there's a little more weed and banter going on. It's uh, it, it it seems to strike the right tone for that. But it, you know, you can see in the in the montage here, there's going to be some brutal stuff in this game. Oh yeah, like, you know, so it's yeah. how Rockstar rolls. Um, but I think they're they're striking the right balance for tone in their in their marketing here. Oh, the first thing I forgot to mention, that I should have mentioned right out of the gate, is no online at launch. Yeah, the online mode is coming in November, um, which again is kind of in line with what happened with GTA Five. Yep, that's not a big deal. This game is so big that most people will just be finishing the campaign. Yeah, it was by the time the online launch. Yeah, GTA Five was super bare bones at launch. Yeah, um, and it, you were getting nothing at launch. Funny at thing launch. is, uh, so when, when Red Dead One launched, Red Dead Redemption One launched, um, the first thing I played was the online because my group online we were you know we would chase achievements all the time. And the, the the thing we usually did was you go on and get the online achievements immediately, so you don't have to worry about coming back to it when no one's playing it anymore. Right. And a lot of times early on, like some of those achievements, are like oh, kill ten people without being killed or whatever, tends to be easier on day one because no one knows what they're right. doing yet. Yeah. And so we went around and did all the online stuff <laughs> like on the first that's smart on the first like few days or something. <laughs> so when I went went to play the the campaign because that's all on the same map. Right. So part of yeah. the problem with playing the campaign was I'd already ridden all through this whole map like already yeah and now i was doing it again in like a snail's pace because right. it was slow that the story unfolded so i kind of regretted playing the online first um so that was certainly not my plan for this one so i don't mind the online's coming later here's my here is my biggest concern about this game and it's just a personal thing for me because i don't generally like games that do this survival elements are a huge part of this mm -hmm. uh eating resting dealing with the elements the heat and the cold Mm -hmm. That is not something I typically like to do in video games. Well, I'm interested to see exactly how important some of that stuff is because Rockstar's kind of pushed that angle, the the kind of the the bodily maintenance thing before. You also have the camp that you have to take yeah, care of and but maintain. The, but they've pushed that kind of thing before, and it's always turned out to be fairly cosmetic. Like, you remember when you thought you have to work out and eat all the time in San Andreas, and it turned out, no, you just basically get... CJ to wherever you want him to be, and he'll stay that way. Oh, the by the way, the that is how that is also in this game. Uh, yeah. If you eat too much, you gain weight. Oh, yeah, but I'm but it's like what I'm saying is like they pushed that on San Andreas as well, and it was not a factor in how you played the game. Well, so. I I would say that that was a case where they oversold a feature. Yeah, where they made it sound like it was this really grandiose thing, and then ultimately it was very simple. Right, and what I'm saying is, if you expect to spe sell 15 million of these things. You can't bog it down into like, oh, you're too cold to go do what you want to do. Um, at the very least, I expect you to be able to turn most of that. Well, off. it says like your stamina goes down and you do everything more slowly. Yeah, that's what the preview said. Unless you can turn all that off and play it like an arcade game, which uh, I bet you will. That would be good for me. Uh, it's, but not, yeah. it's not how I play it, but I would I would think that accessibility options for kind of you know people who aren't interested in living the life would be uh, in order. I was surprised again, to hear that the is... character can gain weight, though, mm -hmm. and change, like, his size. That's For right. a story-driven game like this, a lot of times they want to keep total control over stuff like that. Yeah, it was, you're just probably adding weight to the midsection of the, of the figure. It's not really going to change the game too much. Um, I mean, you're not going to be lifting weights like CJ to, like, burn it off, right? No, but <laughs> you, you got enough exercise running around the frontier i would imagine 
But um, yeah, it's, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing. Um, like, we'll see. Slagathor in the chat says it might play out similar to the way Cold and Hot was handled in Breath of the Wild, which mm. I didn't like either. So <laughs> you just had to change the clothes at that point. Yeah, I don't know. You had to have the right clothes, or you couldn't go to specific areas. Right. It's a, it was a gate gating mechanism. Right. Yeah. And I don't. I hope that that is not the case. Yeah, that's fine. I don't like that. I mean, the first game was full of gating shit for no reason whatsoever. At least that gives you a reason you can't go there. Yeah. Before it was just like, no, nah, you can't go here because we don't want you to yet. Like, yeah. You can't go up to the snowy part yet. Why? Because you, because you can't. Because the story says you're not, you're not supposed not to go there to. yet. You're not allowed to, and you can't swim for some reason. So yeah, yeah. Well, it. apparently they're swimming in this, and it's not good. Mm. That was the only criticism that I saw across all the coverage. Is swimming ever good? Yeah, and, and uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider was great. Yeah, it was all right. More, I was more that's, than all right. That's good. one. Yeah. There's other games. I think the 3D Mario games have great swimming. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Um, cut. I'm not a swimming fan in games. Character customization is a much bigger thing than I ever thought. Um, you can change your haircut at the barber. You can change your facial hair. Um, apparently, there's a wide variety of things that you can do with that. Uh, the clothes is a big deal. The clothing that you wear, obviously, mm. for the... The weather elements we talked about earlier, that's a big part of it. Um, not just your clothing, but also blood and mud. You have to keep the clothes clean. Yep. You can see that in some of this where like, there's stains on his blue shirt from where he got mud on them in that fight scene. And it that, changes and like, how... And like, they're still there. Like, you can see there. Like, it, it, yeah. It's dried and it's, it's you know, more or less the mud's off him, but it's still stained. All that shirt. kind of stuff is it's like in crazy how intense mm -hmm. it is. All those little details like that. Like If you go hunting and... Uh, you lay an animal across the back of your horse. The blood gets on the horse. The blood gets on you. Uh, the blood will stay on the horse until you wash the horse or run through a stream or it rains. Like, just crazy detail like that. Like, I was blown away by some of those details. Um, the other thing that's changed a good bit is how you uh, deal with other characters, the dialogue system. Mm. Your gun is really important in how you deal with other people, what you're doing with it, where it is, whether it's drawn. Um, your guns get dirty and you have to go and clean them. Just the level, or they don't work the way they're supposed to. The level of detail in this game is just a, a different level. I, I mean, provided all this comes to fruition mm -hmm. and it's in the final game, I really struggle to find another game that has the attention to detail of what's been detailed about. Yeah, Red although, I mean, I would say that like, you're right on the ragged edge of busy work. Yeah, you're right. Point. Feature bloat. I think it's yeah. the, probably the most common term that people use. You have to clean your horses. You have to, and if you don't, like they get nappy and they don't want to work with you. We already talked uh, prior in prior episodes of Game Face about permadeath of the horses. Your horse dies; mm -hmm. it's gone for good. And you oh, build a bomb. All scrubbing is for nothing. Yeah, and you build a bomb with your horse over time as well and you have to start all over and when you as you build your bomb with your horse it's more reliable it won't spook as easy it can learn tricks um <laughs> this game is insane it really and if you kill an animal and leave it there it will attract well you can see perfect timing it will attract pred it will attract predators to it it will also decompose <laughs> over time and the pel if you shoot an animal if you shoot it with a gun it loses value versus shooting it with an arrow. When you go to skin the animal and butcher the animal, you can see the entry and exit wounds hmm. on the model of the animal. It is just insane, Matt. This game is freaking nuts. Um, trains are used for fast travel. You can hijack the trains and jump on the trains and take control of the trains. Um, uh, the de new dead eye mode it, it has like a new feature well that lets you target vital organs it works on both mm -hmm. enemies and the creatures in the world that's good because the dead eye mode in the last one was a little nebulous yeah um what else customizable hud you can add whatever you want to the hud or take away everything you can play it clean you can just add just your health bar if you want you can completely set it up however you want to um holy cow matt like i mean this is this is like game of the forever level of what we're talking about right now. I mean, this game is doing, I don't know if it's doing a ton of stuff that's never been done, but it's doing everything that has ever been done in a video game. It's really freaking nuts. 
But I guess if you're a rock star and your perspective is, hey, we put out one game every six to eight years, you yeah. kind of have to make it that good. Well, a lot of it, like, again, like, a lot of what you described does not sound fun to me. Um, I don't want to wash my clothes and my horse all the time. Like, that's... Or, and my you also God, have to like, keep coming back, not only to like sustain yourself, but a whole camp of people. Yeah, like, that, that could very easily just bog down into, like, you know, busy work. It but also think, said some resources are just automatically given to your camp. You don't yeah. have any control over it at all. Like, as soon as you get it, it's part of it is given to the camp, and you don't get to keep it. Yeah, well, I like State of Decay, and that's how that works there. So it's not, it's not a death knell, but it's like the balance of what to do versus what you have to, what you want to do versus what you have to do is important. I think most of those features seem like pretty natural evolutions of the path yeah. Rockstar's been on, certainly with, since GTA V. Do you think it's a case of where they're just like, what do we do now? Yeah, well, I mean, they seem to be tra trying to build their way up to making, you know, a game that is almost indistinguishable from reality in some ways, or at least, like, kind of a fictional reality that, that has a verisimilitude that is beyond what any anyone else is attempting. So uh, I, I, th I think it makes sense that of all, all these features make sense as something that Rockstar would prioritize as something they want to have part of the world. Um, and and you know and in some ways it might just be a dry run for GTA 6 because you oh know, it absolutely is you Red, know it I is. mean Red De and not to say this game is any kind of small potato right, but it's, right. it ain't GTA yeah. you know like you know this a lot of this has to be sort of a test bed for what GTA 6 will be to the nth degree yeah you know? so, and I think it is mm -hmm. I think it absolutely is so more excited I bet less you'll be excited. able to ride horses in GTA 6. As like a cop or something, maybe. Yeah, you'll be able to get horses. Like, yeah. I mean, it'll be cars and planes. Why not? I mean, like, if you've yeah, already you, got if the you've tech. You've got this there. Like, yeah. why not? Yeah. <laughs> it would be dumb not to include it in some way, shape, or form. So I'm actually not sure about your answer to this, but after this new round of information, this new round of footage, are you more excited or less excited for this game? It's, it's still about even. I mean, it's yeah, not, it doesn't sound like it impressed you all that much. There's nothing, well, there's nothing about it that like surprises me or blows me away. And there's nothing. There's no in, like you say. There's nothing in here that no one has never has never done before. Yeah. You know, it's just like they're. It's but for a be, lot of games, that would be like their big feature. Eh, but like for, for this, it's just another one. Right. But it's just like, like the the proof is in how it all comes together, how yeah. it feels to play, and and how it all plays out in its own gameplay loop. And and you know, once you got like five hours under your belt, what is this whole thing about? Um, is the story any good? Do I care about any of these characters in the way that I, you know, instantly took to John Marston? Right. Um, am I going to keep staring, be staring at John Marston in the camp, wishing I could be him? You know, like it's, you know, it, it depends. Like I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, it, I'm. It's definitely my most anticipated release for the rest of the year. But um, you know, I, I, you know, the, it's the usual rock star drip feed too, where it's like yeah. we don't we don't see a whole. You see just enough to kind of keep you, you know, and that's important. I mean, that's smart. I, I don't, I'm not saying that they should not do that. I'm saying like that's a smart way to approach it, and it always has worked for them. So they sh certainly shouldn't change it up now. But like the, the 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 end result for me is like, well, I'll let you know when I play it, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the, not the, long the only, to wait now. No, the only thing I know for sure is that it's probably the best looking game of the year. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no it's, it's certainly a top candidate. This will probably be the last time we talk about this game until we have it, yeah. until we play it. Because I don't think Rockstar is going to do another round of previews or anything like that. You think like this that. is their last? I mean, I bet there will be commercials and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They'll, well, they'll put out commercials. They'll probably put out a couple more trailers. Yeah. But I don't think they're going to release any more information about it mm -hmm. until we all get our hands on it. I actually have one more question before we move on about prequels. So I don't know if you watched the show Better Call Saul, which is a prequel mm -hmm. to Breaking Bad. Mm hmm I'm a huge Breaking Bad fan, love the show. I also love Better Call Saul. But one thing I hate about it is that you already know some stuff that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So when you watch the show, it's very hard to get invested in parts of it because you know parts of it are never going to pay off. Um, so right mm -hmm. now, like, there's a romance on Better Call Saul. And you know that ultimately the relationship doesn't work out. You don't know how, you don't know why, because... The other part of the relationship isn't even in Breaking Bad. But you just know it's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. So you watch the show with this weird... I don't even know how to explain it. It's not like a sense of dread. Mm -hmm. What well, is a little bit? Because you're like, okay, well, I know something's going to happen. Either one of them... Like, either the other partner's going to die or is going to get in a fight. Or like, and I just... How do you feel about prequels? 
you got to have a really good reason to tell a prequel story. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, the the shorthand go to why do prequels suck thing is the Star Wars prequels, but um, I think yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think the problem is that like like you say, sometimes sometimes the anticipation of knowing more than the characters know is cool and can enhance something. In fact, if I was going to change one thing about Black Panther, which is one of my favorite movies of the year, the beginning of Black Panther, they sh- they start with that flashback to, yeah. ni- to 1993 and you see the the you know the, the king and his brother and all that stuff. So, and then it cuts away and you have to wait until like halfway through the movie to find out that um or to catch it, yeah. To, to catch up and see that rest of the flashback where you find out that oh the king actually killed his brother right. to, uh, to because he betrayed. betrayed. It's, if you haven't seen it yet, you're too late. It's been it's been over half a year. Um, so you have to and like there's but the thing is like that revelation is is like one of three big revelations from that flashback right, that you find right. out like halfway through the movie. That one thing that 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 he killed his brother that should have been in the beginning, because part of the point of the movie is like. T'Challa coming to terms with the death of his father and what it means to be his father and what it means to not be his father and what it means to accept that his father was not a perfect person. Uh-huh. And if you as an audience member know that he betrayed his brother or did, did that horror, that, 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 you know, maybe crossed the line when he did that. I mean, that's a matter of opinion whether he did the right thing or not there. Right. If you, if you know that he did that and T'Challa doesn't know that, you're waiting for T'Challa to find that thing out about his father and that changes the dynamic between him and his father to the audience and makes it a more interesting first act so if you give you give the audience a little bit if you make the audience smarter than the character a little bit and you pay that off properly in a short amount of time uh, that can be a really good enhancement to how a narrative unfolds however if you're going to do a prequel like say Gotham where you know that damn kid is never going to be Batman and you're just sitting around waiting for everyone waiting. to like kind That's of what it is with kind of act like the penguin kind of right. act who's yeah. the joker who cares like you're never going to see it no, so what's right. the point do you hit you hit the nail on the head what you're the talking about with better call saul is exactly that it's yeah. like it's like you know you're never going to see the outcome because you already saw it in Breaking Bad, so what are you tap dancing for? Yeah. And that's the thing. With prequels, you're always waiting for something to happen. And right. I don't like that. Like, I don't... It, the story you're telling in a prequel has to be worth telling on its own. It has to be yeah. something that, like, you don't need to have had investment in this story or these characters from because of the later story to go back and care about. That's also a problem with Solo, in my opinion, is, like... The whole thing where it's like, oh, here's how he got this. Here's how this happened. Here's how this happens. Stop it. Like, no one would, you wouldn't do that in a story that wasn't intentionally a prequel to this thing you already care about. Right. So, like, you just, you, if you can't make a prequel story just as its own story, and anything that's tied to the original story is like an, is an incidental thing, uh, if you want to see the best example of that ever in, in cinema, Godfather Part Two. Yeah. Uh, the story that they're that they're telling about Mar- you know, Marlon Brando's character, younger, is the, all the flashbacks, and then there's a current day story with uh, Michael Corleone. The story with Michael Corleone is the follow up to the events of the first movie, and the backstory of Don Corleone, uh, Vito Corleone, is a fascinating story in its own right. Yep. And you don't even need to have seen the first movie to care about this guy going through this, the, 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 the struggles of being an immigrant and setting this whole thing and up. Better Call Saul is like that. It's good yeah, better call, that I mean, Better Call Saul is routinely called by a lot of critics better than Breaking Bad. I, mean, I would not say that. I don't I, know if I'd go that far. I've only yeah. seen the first season of, of Better Call Saul. But it's again, I think they, for the most show. part they've found, and I wouldn't have thought they did. I wouldn't have thought that that was the character you could hang yeah, a prequel crazy. on. But yeah. they found it and yeah. they did it. So, I mean, Rockstar isn't stupid. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if they decided this is how they wanted it, I mean, partly is because if you go any further forward past Rock, Red Dead Redemption, you're in like 1925 yeah, or something. Not you're, really you're running like... out of the Old West yeah. at that point. Yeah. Um, so I can only hope that they found a reason why you care to see these events unfold between, you know, Bill, Bill, what's his name? You know, the guy that Marston's hunting... No, oh, I don't know. In the first, it in the original game, it, all, it, you know, there better be a good reason we care about seeing it all play out among these people because they did leave it fairly vague as to what, you know, there was betrayal and people killed people or whatever, yeah. but we don't know exactly necessarily what happened. So you're kind of waiting, for, you know, and and you can, the anticipation of waiting for something inevitable can be played out well. I think Spider Man does that well when you yeah. first see Doctor Octopus or not, you know, Doctor Octavius. Right. 
you're like, oh, well, oh, I know well we is. know what's coming, yeah. but when is it coming? When's yeah. it gonna... And you How see, these, you keep happen? seeing these little flashes throughout the game yeah. of like, oh, is it now? If you is play it now? with it. Yeah. If, you, if you know that and you, you play with that expectation of the audience, you can make it a really effective storytelling tool. But a lot of people that I think make prequels they do not do that. Don't on Better do that. Call Saul, no, they, no, they don't. No, it's just you tell the story. They just tell it. the story. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a valid way to do it. No, it drives me crazy mm. because you, what you do is you end up paying way more attention to that relationship. Mm. So any little thing that happens, you're like, oh, here's where they start to break up, or here's where something good, and then like it doesn't happen. You just constantly are getting mm. like tugged on that string, like. I don't know. It, it's interesting, right? Yeah. Prequels. If you're invested in what's come, mm -hmm. what comes later, and you know what comes later, it's it's a different way to experience a piece of entertainment. It's a, it's a tightrope act, I think. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it can very easily fall one way or the other. Um, I'll be honest. Uh, it's one the fact that that it's reported that uh, Beyond Good and Evil Two is at least partially a prequel. But yeah. like you know, like when in the E3 trailer where he sees, oh, he's like, oh, Jade and Jade's right. part of the pirates or whatever. Mm -hmm. That this is before. The original game um that's interesting to me but at the same time it's like oh i might just be waiting for them to, yeah if you play that out too long i'm just waiting for her and Paige to be friends again right you know because yeah. to get where we were before yep absolutely. um it's it's a matter of finding a reason to tell that story yep and uh i i think th there's a short list of developers in the industry that i would trust to find that story and rockstar would be on that list yeah Rockstar, Naughty Dog. Rockstar, Naughty now, Dog. Now Insomniac, maybe. maybe Although I wouldn't Insomniac. have said that before Spider-Man. Uh, Don't Nod, I yep. would put on there. Um, they tell stories well. and um, Telltale. No. <laughs> Ironically enough, no. That's what they call in the industry a callback. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. We're running out of time here. We're going to talk next about Although, the... Although, Tales from the Borderlands, prequel. No, it was. One, of, right. one of people's favorite Telltale games. There you go. You just made my point for me. Uh, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about the Vita, something we never talk about on Game Face, and we probably will never talk about it again. We're going to talk about the Vita because the last stronghold, the last bastion mm. of Sony's handheld has finally given up the ghost, and Sony has announced that it's going to stop production of the Vita next year in Japan. But Vita means life. Yeah. The... <laughs> La Vida Loca. Do you care, Matt? No. No. I don't even know where my Vita is. I, I have a vague idea of where mine is. I think I know where it is. I think it's in its case, which I think I know where that is, but I wouldn't be surprised if I opened it and it wasn't in there. I actually am wondering where my PSP is. I actually ran into like an MS Duo memory card <laughs> the other day, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is probably my PSP mm. memory card. I don't even know where my PSP is at this point. I know where my little PSP, what are they called? The Not the home. It was called... Uh, uh, it had, you couldn't use the UMDs with it. No. PSP Go. Yeah. I know where that is, but I have no idea where my OG PSP is. But let's talk about the Vita, Matt. What went wrong with the Vita? Some people will say nothing because, look, and I probably when we put this on YouTube, someone's going to jump in the comments and be like, you guys are crazy. Vita is the greatest thing ever, blah, blah, blah. We've heard it before. Nah. But l let's talk about the rest of the world mm. that lives in reality. What went wrong with the Vita? Uh, well, they did the same thing they did with the PSP, where they ended up just kind of, here's a bunch of inferior ways to play games you already have on your PS3. Yeah, they never ma like, maximized the platform. Which is funny, because they said at the beginning of the Vita, like around the launch of the Vita, they straight up said, so many people were straight up, I think Tretton even said, he's like, yeah, we made a mistake with the PSP, we we're just offering like ports of things that were already on the console, and the Vita's library will be original titles. And then they didn't do that beyond the launch window. No. Like, they never, ever stuck with investing in exclusive games for Vita. And people who love the Vita, they don't love it for its exclusive games. They love it because, one, you can, like, hack it and homebrew it. Yeah. And, two, because you can play, like, all these indie games on the go. Mm -hmm. But it's crazy to look at these trailers from when it was first announced and it launched and look at all the functionality that was just wasted on this thing. Mm -hmm. Think about the touchscreens on the back, the touchscreens on the front, augmented reality, all this stuff that this thing does... And it literally did it for like the first 12 months yep. that it was available. And after that, all, here's something. I think Sony learned a lesson. Maybe Nintendo learned this lesson a little bit with the 3DS. I think Nintendo took a lot of lessons from this from the Switch. Yep. They took a lot of the reasons people, like the Switch is a hit, are reasons that people like found a niche reason to enjoy the, the Vita. But like Nintendo's, Nintendo saw like the two things that worked about the Vita and like doubled down on them and it worked. Yeah. 
But to me, I think the lesson that was learned through the Vita and to a certain extent, like the initial revision or the initial version of the 3DS is that just keep the junk out because Mm -hmm. all the stuff that they crammed into the Vita, the cameras, all this, they didn't need any of that and all it did was drive up the price what a price dumb of- feature what was that you can pick the golfer up with the back touch screen like who cares right and all that stuff drove up the cost yeah. of the vita to a place where it yeah, was, that was never a, that was a pricey meatball it at was launch. never gonna hit mass market i know i totally i mean honestly i regret ever getting the thing like i think back to how much it costs yeah and how much i paid out of my pocket yep. for this thing because we got sent one but you know at gt that they kept the one that they sent us so i had to buy my own and like the amount of money i spent on this thing I mean, I've honestly played my Vita, I'm guessing if I added up all the hours, probably like 150 hours. That sounds about right. I mean, I played I played Ninja Gaiden Black, and, or Ninja Sigma, or whatever it was, whatever the Ninja Gaiden was, and then I played, I played Persona 4 Golden, and I played Uncharted, and I think that's pretty much it. I played the whole launch library. Shinobi Do 2, I played that too, because it was a Tenchu game. I played the it. whole launch library, and then I think after that, I probably played five games ever. Yeah, it was, it was nothing. And the battery life was po- was terrible because there was so much stuff crammed into it. I, I just think it and the 3DS, you know, with Nintendo putting 3D in the 3DS and now it's like it doesn't even exist anymore. I think those both of those systems taught some valuable lessons. Not that it matters anymore because handhelds are kind of going away at this point. But I think it just shows that, like, ultimately, you just need to make a, a machine that plays games. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that's what people uh, are using was, the Vita for. That was so weird that you could get, like, an AT&T contract with yes, this thing. Yes, they had, like, a mobile so version weird. of it. Like, they launched it like a cell phone, like a version that had mobile and one, or, like, an iPad. Mm-hmm. Like, one that has mobile and one that doesn't. Like, it's just, looking back on this thing now... Remember when they announced the AT&T deal and the whole press conference audience booed? Yeah, because everybody hated <laughs> AT&T. That, cause that's back when iPhones were locked to yeah. AT&T. Yep. And so people had this negative opinion about AT&T. But if you're Sony, you're like, hey, if it's good enough for Apple, it's good enough for the Vita. Mm-hmm. But it is crazy to look at the... Sony was out of its mind making this yeah. thing. I mean, it was, a, it was a beautiful piece of hardware. Oh, just, yeah. The screen it, is just gorgeous. So much gorgeous. of it didn't matter when it came it to what it really didn't. had to do to, to be competitive. It yep. wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, ba- the back touch screen. Like, Why? Why well, you? to try to make, I think because they want to make up for the lack of sh- extra shoulder button, um, which kind of kind of works. It kind of works. Yeah, it was better I mean, they're than just nothing. Digital buttons, obviously, but yeah, <laughs> it's better than nothing when you're playing like backwards compatible or like PlayStation Classic stuff. Why do you but think like, Sony gave up so quickly on this? Because it didn't work. It was, I mean, it, was, it worked. Everything, all the features worked. Well, I mean, it didn't work in the sense that it didn't do what they were expecting it to do. I mean, you mean financially? Yeah. I mean, I remember when the thing was in the run-up to launch, and like you'd see people online, just all everyone was like, "Oh, it's going to crush the 3DS," and like the Vita is going to be the biggest thing in handheld ever. I mean, people thought this thing was going to just rip the whole world apart. Just like they and thought like, the PSP was going right, to tear the whole world thing. apart. But it's just like at least the PSP did okay. At some point, you gotta you gotta learn that power doesn't win the battle, especially when you're handheld. I think power matters less now than it ever has. Yeah. It's like everything looks good now. Or everything looks good enough now at the very least. I mean, be outside of the enthusiast circles, I would say that's true. I mean, nobody knows the difference between, you know, oh, this ran at 30 frames a second, this runs at 45 frames. It's like, okay, like that's that's a problem if you're if you know what you're looking at, but most people don't. So it's not you know, and the functionality is more important. It's like you know, what, what is it, what is it about the switch that made it sell and this didn't sell? Well, the fact that because the the key thing in the switch is that you can take it on the go and you or you can well, take it out of the thing. Too. But software as well. But it's I mean, that's like, where Sony really dropped the ball for sure. But like at the same time, like you'd think it would sell a little better just on the basis of like. Look at the Switch. Look how many people are buying shit they already own on other systems just so they can keep carry it You're around right. with them. You're right. Like, that was happening on this, too, but it didn't happen because, A, the price was too crazy, and, B, uh, Sony wasn't putting the real stuff that they needed on there, but also because it was a bloated piece of hardware that did all these things it didn't need to do. We also the, have forgot the, about remote play. That, That's another that, feature. That, that by there. the way, is, is like, you know, like the Switch doesn't feel overpriced in that regard, but the Joy-Cons sure do. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like 80 bucks for those things feels ridiculous, even no matter how much of a Switch fan you are. Yep. Um, the remote play stuff is, <coughs> is a neat trick, but again, not you had to practical. be on the Wi-Fi network, and at that point, why am I not just playing it on the TV? Yep. You know, and you know, for a while there, they, they, they would come with, um, you know, like you'd get, 
the the Vita version of the game with the PlayStation Three version or whatever. And I'm like, cool. I will never use the cross buy because like, yeah. it, it just always came down to me of like, well, why don't I just wait until I can play it in a, on a superior format because I don't get anything that extra. Oh, then there were the memory card. It's so funny watching these trailers. Oh, the and just remembering all this stuff. That, by the way, are still crazy. I know, I know. And now, I mean, I'm sure there's people now that are going to try to snatch them all up because they're going to stop yeah. manufacturing. And it's like, if you really love this thing, you're going to need them. Well, that was, I mean, that's just Sony in general. Their, their obsession with trying to create a new universal memory format that is never going to, you know. Just like the Memory Stick Duo I just talked about. They've been like, trying to make fetch happen in that arena for like two decades. So. Yeah. Go, go, hell, to some degree, you could say that goes back to Betamax. Now that it's all said and done, what is the best Vita game? Persona 4 Golden. But probably. that wasn't exclusive, was it? Well, that version of it was. Yeah, Golden was. Golden was. Yeah. I would say that game right there, Tearaway. Tearaway's good, but it's also not exclusive. I have it on PS4. Only after it failed on Vita, though. Yeah, but I don't need a Vita for it, is my point. Yeah, but I'm The just... only way to play Persona 4 Golden is on the Vita. Initially, it was supposed to be an exclusive, though. Right. And it, it just tanked, but it and they're like... But I don't know. I think... Th- in my opinion, the best game was Tearaway. It also made use of the hardware, which a lot of games didn't. It's like they put all this junk in there, and then like none of the games ever made any use of it. Like Again, the augmented reality stuff. Look how big of a deal it was when they first in- announced this thing. Like It's just a- AR everywhere. And now it's kind of come full circle, and AR is a big thing again. With Pokemon Go and Apple's uh, AR kit built into every phone... I mean, in a lot of ways, it was just way ahead of its time, but ultimately, I think what doomed it was just a lack of software. Yeah. A lack of compelling experiences you could only get on that platform. And that's why I like Tearaway. Or at least, or at least nothing that like, made the, uh, the, the cost of entry worth, yeah. you know, worth considering. Yep. Because like, you also forget, it's like you, know, you still had to spend like 60 to 80 bucks on a damn memory card yep. and stuff like that. It was, it was a lot to it. It hurt when I bought that thing. In fact, I would not buy one until I got a gift card from somebody. Yeah. I was like, I'm not spending my own money on one of these things. It's a total ripoff. But you don't have an alternative. Nobody ever made any like bootleg versions of them that you could buy from like China no. or whatever. Like, and it was there were never like generic ones or nope. anything. It was it was. And it was so I was like, oh, I got this Sony proprietary. I'm like, I got this gift card from uh, from GameStop. I'm like, I'm just gonna spend it on this completely outrageously overpriced memory card. That you never came close to filling up. No. No, because I know, actually, by the time I got that card, I had pretty much stopped playing my Vita. Yeah. And I never really played it much again after that. So I will say it was a very, very pretty screen. Oh, my gosh. That OLED, just freaking gorgeous. I mean, the system was awesome. If they actually supported it, it could have been something great. Yeah. But Sony didn't. And, I mean, ultimately, it probably works out for Sony because PlayStation 4 is just doing gangbusters. And I'd rather play Sony's exclusive games on a PS4 than on a Vita. Yep. For so sure. there you go. So rest in peace, Vita. I, I really feel like I hardly knew you. That's why the, the, like I never built a relationship with that <laughs> handheld. It's like even when I had both the 3DS and a Vita, if I was traveling, I was taking the 3DS with me. And why? Because it had games that were worth playing. Mm-hmm. And it just goes back to the thing that we've been saying for forever. Hardware is irrelevant without software. It doesn't matter how powerful it is, how many gadgets or doodads it has, how many features it has. Unless there's compelling software to play on it, it's just a piece of plastic with transistors. So yep. there you go. All right, we're going to move on to our last topic of today's show. We're going to talk two about... two rest in pieces in one show. I know. I, when I was going to intro this show as like the death episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh, there's only two. I'm like, I'll give it a break. But uh, we're going to talk about something that is absolutely not dead and something that's not even alive yet because that has been released. And that is Forza Horizon 4. Uh, one of my games I've drafted on my video game fantasy team. Um, looks, looks like a good pick. Initial reviews are out. Uh, they're pretty good. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I think IGN almost gave it a perfect score, but then I saw some others that were like around an 8 or something like that. It's probably going to settle in around a high 8, I'm guessing. Well, I think it's going to be in the 90s. You think? Yes. Too many perfect scores. Is that based on the fact that you've played it, or...? No, based on the fact that I've been re- watching the reviews pop up all day, and th- there's a lot of 10s. Are there? Oh, yeah. Wow. Impressive. Uh, so Matt and I have both been playing this. Matt, you've been playing the demo. In the demo, yeah. And I've been playing the final version. I just got it a couple days ago, so I'm not crazy far into uh, the game. Because I, I actually I started playing the demo, 
And I played that for like an hour or two, and then I got the code in my inbox, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, okay, well, I'll stop the demo. And then the regular game starts just like the demo. So your save doesn't carry over? It did not carry over. I had to start all over again. I'm going to stop playing that then. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow, there's a lot to talk about. I took notes uh, during my playtime with this, and I have a lot of them, actually. Uh, Matt, what's, what's your initial impressions of it? It's Forza Horizon. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that, <laughs> that's really all you need to yeah. say, right? <laughs> it's, I, you know, it's really good. It looks amazing. Uh, I, I like the setting better than last time. Uh, uh, I gotta say, my you like the setting better. Yeah, I like I like this the England setting better than, I, than Australia. I think that may be a case of you changing your mind the more you play it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I thought so, I, I thought I sure so like at England. first, and then the more I played it, the more I realized that there's only one urban area in the whole game, and there is not, despite the fact that the big selling point of this is the four seasons. There is no variety in terrain in this game the way there mm -hmm. was with Australia. It's okay. Yeah. Like, we'll see. We'll see if you keep playing. If you part, feel that part way. of my problem with Australia is I ended up off roading in sports cars too much. Yeah, like I, didn't, I, I, I did that too. Like, that was fun though. I'm also a big uh, Lamborghini going across a cornfield. I'm also a big <laughs> Top Gear fan, so like, yeah, kind of the, the 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 terrain and the approach for like kind of the British countryside is uh, is appealing to me. Okay. Um, like, I don't care that much about the variety of, of uh, I do like Song of Ice and Tires. That's a good, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, Playground Games. Well yeah, played. Yeah. Um, I'm into it. I, I, I have to say, like, I did, I've been playing a little bit of, uh, a little bit of three this month. I played some of two, because two is going away uh, right. in a few days, if you don't know. Uh, the licenses are expiring, so Forza Horizon 2 is being delisted from the store on, I think, after September 30th. Uh, currently, the, uh, the all the DLC is on sale for twenty three bucks, which is like one hundred and twenty bucks or something full price. Wow! So if you if you I mean, just if you care away. about Forza Horizon two, I don't think they can contractually. Uh, uh, care if you care about Forza Horizon two, uh, you buy it now because it's going away. Um, but again, I, going back to that question on Pactor Factor this week about licensed music, like. Yeah. Well, these are the car licenses, apparently. Oh, wow. Interesting. Um, car licenses also expire, which is why I also don't think you'll ever see Gran Turismo on that PlayStation Classic. No, you definitely won't. Um, the, uh, I, went I went back and played some of that. I also played uh, Forza Horizon 1 when it went. Uh, it got the 4K update for the Xbox One backwards compatibility. I played that. Um, and, I, you know, Forza Horizon, I think the first one is still my favorite. The first Forza the first Horizon? I, I, I like the first Forza Horizon the best. I would not. Um, I'm de I definitely do not agree with that. I uh, I just feel like it had better focus, and I liked the. Well, yeah, the, it's the, definitely way more focused. It's way more simple. Yeah, and I like the Colorado setting better than Australia, or like kind of the. I found. I actually found. I might agree with that. I actually found Forza Horizon 2's like Mediterranean island rather obnoxious. It was a little constrained. Tropical um, environments after a while do tend to. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like living in L.A. Like, people come here, and they're like, oh, my God, it's so gorgeous here, the weather. You're like, really? Yeah, wait for it. It's like, it's like this every day. <laughs> wait, until like, the, wait until the 4,000th day where it's just hot and sunny, <laughs> hot and sunny, hot and sunny, And I realize there's a lot of people right now who are like, screw you guys. Like, I'm, I had to deal with this winter on the East Coast or in Europe or whatever. I, I hear you, but I'm from the East Coast where I was used to dealing with weather, and now it's like I would prefer a little more variation in weather maybe mm. after living in California for <laughs> 20 years like I mean I think the high point I mean as much as I like one the high point of the series is probably the Hot Wheels expansion for 3 yeah uh, and I hope they do something like that for for, the, for 4 well the big one in this is like um, all the Halo stuff at least so far that's kind of yeah. the big thing but I mean just the, the the absolute craziness of that Hot Wheels expansion yeah, 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 yeah. with like the loops and everything was like yeah. I ho hopefully they'll do another one for this because that was a great that was a great idea and it, they pulled it off beautifully the other um, thing, too, about this one is that um, one of the, the big changes for it was actually DLC for three, which is mm -hmm. winter driving. Yeah. And so that was like a DLC pack for Forza Horizon 3. And again, it's one of the four seasons that's in this game. And the weather is a big... And it does make a big difference, let's yeah. be honest. Like, I don't like it, though. Good. I don't like it. I don't like driving in the snow. I don't like slipping around turns and like everything just feels a lot more random. No, I, I feel it's, I think it it's feels fine. realistic. I think it's fine. I'm not I, I'll saying tell you, it's not the hardest time I have is actually, with it. the hardest time I have is actually during spring. 
I think really? spring, spring, spring slippier, slipperier for me because like I was trying to drive through the mud and it was just like you never quite knew how the car was going to handle as soon as it landed. Here, here's uh, the thing though: the spring snow, and fall fine. are just they're just aesthetics. There is they're oh uh, now their leaves are a different color. I don't agree with that. And there's a couple of puddles here. No, I don't agree with that for spring at all. Spring is a very different driving experience. How? Uh, because the, the the roads are slicker and the rain is very present and everything is mud. It was a completely different way of driving. Fall, I agree, it's basically cosmetic. Fall and summer are basically the same with different different pretty parts. Yeah. Um, but winter and I think winter and spring, I was very impressed with how different they made those feel. Now, once you get the final game, you'll see that the way the seasons are set up is they're like five-day chunks. Mm. So you play each season for five days, and then it turns, and then you move on to the next mm. season, which I think is a little weird. I'd have to believe that uh, eventually you get the ability to change seasons at will. I haven't got there yet. I would, I would, that maybe. I, would I haven't think, read any reviews yet either to know. But. I would think that that's a, uh, like a, like a, you know, there was a whole skill tree in, in the others that I'm sure that somewhere in there you can unlock that. Well, there are, I mean, there are, there's a schedule. Like, they have mm -hmm. big events set up around. Yeah, I would think once you finish kind of the main, I, I hesitate to call it the main story. Right. But well, like, actually, with this one, that's not that crazy. Oh, there's an actual, there's more narrative. Oh, yeah. Because previously it's just like, hope you get that wristband, bro. Like, oh, that's... no, no, no. No, it doesn't go away, Matt. Story and stuff is huge in this one. That's mm. one of the, I would say maybe the biggest change aesthetically about it is that story is a much bigger part of it. In fact, they announced today that uh, a big chunk of the DLC that's coming post-launch is story-based stuff. Ooh, that's an interesting choice. So I'm guessing at this point you've experienced just the stunt driving stuff. Stunt driving and the street race stuff and the off-road guy and, um, yeah. And the, yeah, have like you got the, to the whole influencer YouTuber stuff yet? No. Yeah. I don't know if that's in the demo. It, uh... Because they, basically I finished it, all the events and they said I qualified for autumn, but now I got to drive around and basically waste time until it becomes autumn. Yeah. And, uh... So I've just been driving around, driving through danger signs and like speed traps. It's basically the only thing there is to do. Yeah, you start getting like inane commentary, like that'll look great on my YouTube channel, bro. <laughs> I mean, this series has always been a yeah. little broy. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's been a lot broy. You also have there's like female YouTubers that talk to you too, and they're all just like, put it up on my YouTube channel. It's like, okay. Uh, I mean, this game has always been kind of like, hey, what's the cool thing two years ago? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're gonna put it in. The first game. one, the first one, I think suffers from that the most. Oh uh, yeah, it was. It's the gotten most better about it, of them like, all. That first one is like, the the one thing I don't like about the first one is like because you don't have a choice of who your character is, so you're just sort of random dude, and like the girl who runs the 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 festival is constantly is like, you're really impressive. It's like just, <laughs> I don't need like the fake computer girl like flirting with me in my fake Try. car, dude. Yeah. Like that's not you're not getting me anywhere with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so well, and now in this one, I'm playing a woman named Tatiana, so we'll see what they do with that. <laughs> well, this one's pretty dull, too. I mean, most of the people that you meet are just like, hey, I run the dirt races at the Forza Horizon Festival, mm -hmm. and if you impress me, I'll get you in some more dirt races. Yeah, I saw, I'm like, like, he's wearing a very nice shirt for someone who runs the dirt races. <laughs> I'm just saying. But yeah, this is way more story-driven. But one thing I think you probably haven't got to, and I don't know if the, the free demo will even let you get there, is when everything cracks open and you actually play like the real game. Yeah, it hasn't done. If it if the demo does that, it hasn't done it yet, and I'm apparently not going to find out because if my progress doesn't get carry over, I'm not doing it. Yeah, you're not going to spend any more time on it. But uh, once the game turns into what it really is, it is an open world shared experience. Mm -hmm. um, the best number I could guess is I I don't know 12, 15 people in my game at a time. It I seemed like I think that's like. about right. Yeah. Um, and I got in at the end of the review period. A lot of people have been playing it already. And as you can tell, their reviews are up already and mine is not. Um, but I did kind of catch the tail end where I got to join in and play with everybody else. And it seemed like around 10 to 15 people are in the world with you at a time. And it's important because at the top of, an hour, of, of every hour, there's these things called forts a -thon, where there are these special events that happen in the world and you get an alert and you have to drive to a location. Everybody who's in that server with you, you all drive to that location, and then you have to work together to accomplish goals. So one of the first ones that I did was, hey, here's a ramp. You need to 
get X number of points from doing jumps off of this ramp mm. to complete the mission. And so you take turns, like going off the ramp, like all 10 of you or whatever. And obviously the more people you have, the easier it is to like reach the goals or whatever. Um, and I like that about it. Like I like one, how it gathers people together. It was like the first time I really realized, hey, these aren't just drive avatars. Like yeah. these people are actually like humans who are playing I, I don't in the like game. this, I have yeah. to say. I don't like this, like the, the race finishes and you go to some <laughs> weird blank studio and look at a bunch of giant OLED screens. Again, this is this makes perfect sense inside Forza Horizon. Yeah. This is the type of like, stuff these games always do. I just didn't need that. There's so much currency in this game, man. There's like main EXP. Then you get EXP for every driving discipline. Then you earn EXP towards getting into the event for whatever season that mm -hmm. you're in. And there's a whole then there's a whole other set of currency. I'm trying to remember what it, I don't think I have a note of saying what the what it's called. But there's a whole other currency set up just for this whole other per it's impossible to follow. Like, where am I? What am I leveling up? What can I do now? What can I not do? I don't know, but those bars sure fill up good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's I mean, that's really, that's really all that matters, right? Um, but it also means that there are always options popping up on the map. Like, mm -hmm. once, once you get out of, like, the training stage or whatever, um, and you get into the open world, the online persistent world, that's when things really start to crack open and, and, and icons just start... Mm -hmm exploding all over the map and there's just more stuff that to do that yeah, you could I don't ever... mean I don't mind all the all the stuff post race like level up stuff. I yeah. just feel like when you stick it in that studio with that like big screen it, it feels sterile to Where me. is he? Where are know. you? I, it looks oh, like he's, he looks like you got zapped to the Gran Turismo menus for yeah. a moment. It's just like and he's like that's backstage at the Price is Right or something. <laughs> like, I don't even know what's going. on. I mean, on. I know it's just an abstraction of what's going on, and like it, it's an opportunity to see your your own avatar and, and other players' avatars. I saw I've seen you in mine a couple times. Like, I've, I haven't seen you. I've seen a lot of Bloodworth. Well, it's because uh, Bloodworth and I reviewed well, Forza Horizon three together, kind of, and I think whatever reason they've connected like the two of us. Mm. Well, yours is interesting because the only one that looks vaguely like you, because uh, everyone else, no one else can modify their avatar. Well, yet. the character creation's terrible, also. So yeah, but I can't even there change my damn shirt. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. it's not in the demo so far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go over some other changes really quickly. Um, oh yeah, the Forza Thon credits are the set is the other currency. Mm. Uh, you can use those for rare cards and yeah, that's some not, other and, stuff. And then influences. But when you do you those up. Forza Thons at the top of the hour, that creates currency that is very specific and only used for one thing, which can get a little confusing. Uh, the bucket list challenges are gone, which was a big part of the last game, um, which were basically just stunts. But yeah, I, don't I, miss I, I ain't mad at that. I don't, I'm not going to miss those. Yep. A lot, of those were, a lot of those were annoying, I thought. Uh, the story and all that crap is bad. Let's just be honest. Well, the, yeah. The visuals look bad for it. The writing's bad. Um, don't go into this thinking that you're going to experience some arresting story. It's no need for speed. Yep. Um, what else? Ra there's radio stations, like pretty much every driving game at this point. Um, here's a big feature, a big change. All the human cars are ghosts, mm -hmm. which some people may freak out about. But I honestly didn't have a problem with it. Because it keeps people from ramming, like you said, some drivers are overly aggressive or whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the people who like to drive that way are going to hate it. The people who hate people that drive that way are going to love it. But that's a big change. Like before, uh, other human cars were always solid. And if you hit them, you would mm -hmm. wreck. And, and I think the reason they did that was because of the forza -thon stuff where you have to work together. Yeah. I don't think there's any sense. way you could just kind of turn it on or turn it off. And I think the trade-off is worth it because the Forza Thon stuff is really cool and really fun. And I think it's really what kind of sets this apart from the prior Forza games in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, game I, is, I see you picked the same car as I did. Yeah. I picked the TT and then I picked yeah. the WRX. That WRX is beastly, by the way. Um, but it, it's this game is great. Like, the, the whole story stuff is bad and the setup is still dumb. And like Matt said, it's still very bro-y. But I'm already completely hooked into it. Like yeah. I, I can't wait to go home and start rendering this episode, and I'll get down and play a few more hours of it. I can't wait until you have the final version so we can start doing the Forza Thon stuff together. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous, even though the character models look terrible in the cinemas and they're poorly directed or whatever. Yeah, they the need actual to step racing, that up or get some, yeah, some outside get rid of help it. or something. Yeah, it's so bad. What... But the game that you play, the cars, the tracks, the effects, just... 
it's just stunning. And this is base Xbox One, by the way. This mm -hmm. is not on X or S even. This is not HDR, any of this. This is the base Xbox One that you're looking at right now. And it, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, but if you can play it in HDR, oh yeah, do I, so. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it just looks completely stunningly amazing. Uh, we'll probably talk about this game again next week because uh, I've only played. I think I'm about six hours in. Matt mm. just played the demo. Uh, we'll come back. We'll probably it'll probably be a shorter segment next week when we talk about it, just to maybe make some late game observations and maybe and obviously you can chime in a lot more yeah. on well, your when experience. does it go live like friday or something Two, well it depends so if you buy like the more expensive version you can get it a couple days early its official release date is a week from today okay so next tuesday so yeah so we'll be back next tuesday we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, if you guys need a little more uh, feedback before you pull the trigger on that uh, that 60 dollar purchase i would say right now based upon what i've played if you like Forza Horizon 3, you're going to you're going to like this just as much. You'll probably like it more. I can't tell you yet whether you should buy it if you had Forza 3 because so far a lot of it is very similar. And yeah, but if you just want more Forza Horizon, yeah. I mean, I think we everyone knows what they're getting when yeah. they buy this game at this point. Yeah, for sure. It's a great arcade style racing game. In my opinion, Forza Horizon 3 is still probably the best arcade style racing game ever and if this one can best it ultimately this one will take its place so um wait till next week when we tell you whether it's worth the 60 bucks for those of you who already played forza horizon 3 if you have not played a forza horizon since one or two i can tell you right now you should go buy it just absolutely don't even think twice you'll thank me in the morning so we'll talk about it more next week but we just want to get it on your radar i know a lot of you guys may, are gonna have to decide in the next seven days whether you want to pull the trigger on it so we wanted to get some discussion in before you guys had to do that. So there you go. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's time for our trailer of the week. And we're going to show a trailer of the week for a game that we have used every trailer for this game as a trailer of the week. But the difference this time is it's not a 10 minute long cinema. Can you guess what game it is? Or did you look at the rundown? Well, I knew what it was going to be because you didn't want to talk about it in the main show. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> so, because I was worried about it, because I was like, "Oh my God, we got to talk about Death Stranding again." <laughs> and but there no, you go. Luckily, it got to be the trailer week, and I don't have to make up another monologue about why I don't care because all this stuff looks so stupid, <laughs> and it's not going to be a satisfying answer, and we still don't know what the freaking game is anyway. Well, you you can say that because we still don't know what the game is even after this. But here it is. Oh, it, I know. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> it's the Tokyo Game Show 2018 trailer for Death. Stranding. Well, shit. I had a special surprise prepped and everything. But it looks to me like your hands are full. It's no biggie. You can always tweak the rules a bit. Get out alive is not get eaten. Sound like fun? Of course it does. That was a one-minute trailer for yeah. for a Kojima game. Amazing. I didn't know he could make trailers that were only a minute long. I think he can do anything in a minute. <laughs> Seriously. I feel like he just draws everything out as long as he can. He, he did win some uh, brownie points from yeah. me this week. He was hanging out with my favorite band, Record Shopping, in England. Oh, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, which is really bizarre. He had, like, worn their T-shirt, like, last week, and I was like, what? And then he just like, appeared in England, like, record shopping with him. Just kicking it with slow dive. Yeah, it must man. be a good life, man. Mm. You can just go wherever you want. Yeah, I, I, I liked Princess Mononoke, too. You know. Yeah. That was cool. 
Yeah. I mean, that was a one-minute trailer just basically to introduce, hey, Troy Baker's doing a voice in yeah. the game. That's really what it comes down to, which is probably why it's only one minute long. I mean, honestly, if you have a story-driven motion capture performance game, you probably want Troy Baker in it. Yep. Because he's very good at that. Okay, we got questions. We got tons of questions from y'all. Hope you guys are having a great night. Uh, let's see. The first one from W. Matthew. We got to answer it. Uh, what are, what are your, what's your favorite co-op experience? Mine was uh, raiding all Juar, I believe I said that right, in World of Warcraft. Mm. Hmm. Pac-Man Versus was one of mine. Uh, I have had some of the most fun cooperatively playing that, trying to track down Pac-Man as one of the ghosts. I think that was great. Mm. Um, Overcooked, I think, is one of the best cooperative games ever. If you haven't played that yet, I highly recommend it. You can probably get the first Overcooked now for, like, nothing, because Overcooked 2 is uh, right around the corner. Or actually, is Overcooked 2 out? It it's might out. Be. Yeah, I think it is out. You can probably get the first Overcooked for, like, nothing, for, like, pennies. I think... Uh... I think it would probably be the firefight mode in Halo ODST. That's pretty good. We had a, we had a really good horde time mode. Playing that. The first time horde mode was in gears. Gears that was horde really mode fun. overall was good, but I think firefight was my favorite. I think we because we got all the achievements in that, and some of that I remember being pretty crazy. But like we got it done, and it like was it felt very much down to how good we were at it, and not whether the game was being nice to us. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's probably I'd say firefight either that or Left 4 Dead, like one of those. I'll tell you another genre that I really love cooperative games in is sports games. Um, it's very hard. I think the first game that I played that had co-op, local co-op, was NFL Quarterback Club. I think it was 2001 for the N64. And you could play NFL football with other humans on your team. So... I'd be the quarterback, they'd be the running back, or they'd be the wide receiver. And that was the first time I ever experienced anything like that, and it literally blew my mind. Like, being able to play with somebody else playing a sports game, now, obviously, that's no big deal anymore. You can play online with, like, 10 other people in FIFA or whatever. Uh, but back then, like, in the N64 era, being able to play a sports game cooperatively with somebody else, I thought was pretty cool. Oh, mm. uh, what else? The Legacy. Do you think that THQ Nordic will pick up whatever is left of Telltale or Sony uh, to make Playlink games since Supermassive isn't working with them anymore? And Matt, what do you think of the Joker movie? They might. I mean, THQ Nordic has bought just about everything They're else. They're buying up everything else, <laughs> which is funny because THQ was the company everybody else was buying stuff from. Right. Like, when THQ was the opposite of right. Telltale. All they had was stuff to sell off. No, you're right. And then, like, a lot of people didn't even... No one even wanted a lot of THQ yeah. stuff. And now THQ is going back and buying up everybody else's leftovers after they fold. Yeah, or Nordic they just, has really cleaned up with that stuff. It really has. It, it could work. It could yeah. be a very viable strategy. Although, it's strategy. like, you're talking about picking up sort of their tech, I guess? And, like, because... Otherwise, THQ Nordic just go to, like, Warner Brothers and say, Hey, can we make a Batman Season 3 or something? Like, yeah. I, mean, I guess you'd have to have the rights to the Telltale stories, yeah. which would probably be what you'd be buying. Yeah, I mean, I what, do you, but what do you get if you buy it? You don't get anything. I don't know. I, that's what I would have said about buying Darksiders and Titan Quest, too, but they did that. Yeah, but I mean, at least those are IP that that right. company owned. Like, I don't like know. we said earlier, Telltale just doesn't own anything. There's nothing to buy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Sony, like, hiring off a bunch of those people to work on, like, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like there's not enough meat on that bone to really warrant like trying to resurrect it. Yeah, I it really, I think it's just done. I don't yeah. think anything's gonna happen with that stuff. And the Joker movie. I mean, I think Joaquin Phoenix will do a good job. He's a very good actor, uh, but like uh, he's a great actor. But it doesn't, like, it doesn't fit into the. It's not part of the DC Cinematic Universe. Not that that's a bad thing necessarily, but it's like the, the DC movies are just so confused right now, and like you don't. It's like, is is you know, what's Shazam gonna do? Is that in the Wonder Woman still coming out? But is Wonder Woman gonna be like kind of a soft reboot? And now like they're doing this. The Flash movies coming up. Is that gonna be Flashpoint? Are they gonna reset everything? Like, and so now that there's also like the Jared Leto Harley Quinn Joker movie coming up, maybe, but like that's different from the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, and like it, you just hit a point where you're like. What are you doing? Like, I, I mean, it's I don't. Lost its way. It's what it's I mean, doing. there's a lot of talent behind this Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie, but it's like it might be good, but it's like 
why like what, it's so confusing and it's like weird that you take like the, the the talented one and you put it outside your cinematic universe which is not totally ma- nonsensical because your cinematic universe is a disaster but like mm, like it's so weird like i mean like, like i'll see it because like i'll see almost seems anything like a good uh, at, at I'll someone, see almost anything Joaquin Phoenix does. Like yeah. he's he's really good, and you he know, seems like a good choice. I mean, he's for got obvious a, reasons, they had to find somebody else. So, well, no, because it's not related to anything else. It's not a Heath Ledger origin story or anything. Right, but I'm saying because Heath Ledger can't continue to play the character, they had to find someone else to play the character. Well, no, because it's totally unrelated. Apparently, yeah. it's still the Joker, though. Yeah, but so is Jared Leto. Yeah. Like, it's just another version of the Joker. I don't know why you feel you need a, another version of the Joker's origin story that doesn't connect to the Jared Leto version of the Joker. <laughs> because they're grasping at straws, Kyle. Pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. Like, not, I mean, not do? that I think they should because the Jared Leto Joker is awful, but, like, I don't know. I'm just going to go watch Captain Marvel. Like, <laughs> like I don't, I don't know. Uh, Next question from Congrim1. Microsoft announced XO18. A, he even used the quotations, a global celebration, hmm. which is what they're calling it, uh, of Xbox event for November 10th. It's being held in Mexico City. Do you think there is something strategic there besides lower cost, being in Mexico? Uh, anything you would like to see from the event? Well, first of all, a lot of you guys may be too young to even know this, but Microsoft used to do XO events every year. Mm-hmm. And Matt and I were talking before the show and we think the last one was X06. It was 06 or 07. I can't remember which. They used to be huge events. Because 05, 05 was the launch of the 360. Right. And uh, I think they did it one it last It was either year. one or two more times. I can't yeah. remember. They used to be huge. Like, they were PSX before PSX existed. Yeah, but it was, like, bigger than that. Oh, yeah, way was, bigger. Yeah. It was, and, like, every green light in the hemisphere was at, yeah. was at that thing. Yep. And, yeah, <laughs> that's true. And uh, now we're wondering if Sony's going to stop doing PSX because we haven't yeah, heard haven't about said it. Anything. Which normally by now they've at least announced it, and now Microsoft has stepped back into the fray with it, with its X event. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, um, relevance to it being in Mexico, I doubt it, but it is a little strange. I don't know why it would choose that territory to have it. But if you think back in the past. There was never any relevancy to them having it in Europe or anywhere else it's had it in the past. No. I mean, in all honesty, there could be security concerns about having it in the U.S. What do you mean? Well, after the Madden tournament shooting and oh, all that wow. stuff. like you know, you know, it, you know, you're, you're, you're safer <laughs> with the cartels. Country full of psychos. <laughs> hey, we got to get out of the United States. These people are nuts. But um, you know, Mexico City is a big town. I don't know. A lot of history. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know why you'd have it in Mexico City versus anywhere else, but I don't think there's a particular... Maybe he's right. Lower cost. Lower cost could be (laughs) it. Um, Unless they've got something to announce that's related to Mexico. Like if there's some big Mexico-related announcement or like they're going to do like some kind of Aztec game or something. That's, you know, that's, you know, Mexico City's built on an ancient Aztec city. Like, I don't know. I'm just throwing shit out there at that point. But like... I, I don't know. I think they just. I think it's probably maybe they just found a cool venue in a big city and and got a good price. Got a good on price it. on it. Yeah. Uh, it's what probably, the other probably part? a better price than they got at LA Live. <laughs> You're probably right. Uh, anything you would like to see from the event? Yeah, a bunch of exclusives. Yeah. Um, like a bunch. A, a solid release date for Crackdown Three, so I never have to worry about it again. <laughs> and I'm guessing they're going to have some exclusives, or I think they would not have. This yeah. Event. Tell tell me something about the future of Fable. It might be like the debut of like the real debut of like the new Halo. Like gameplay of Infinite or something. Yeah, maybe. Or, yeah. If you're I gonna if you're gonna hold a specific event, you better have something to talk about. Yeah, I mean they're not gonna have this unless they have something big. Yeah. Uh, maybe so the sure. maybe the debuts of a bunch of the games from the developers they bought. And Justin Horman says he was gonna ask the same question. Um, like we announced at E3, we bought these four developers, and now we're gonna show you what they're doing, kind of thing. Now, here's a good one from Super Cordon Blue. Uh, do you think we'll see an OG Xbox Classic? Not anytime soon. Yeah, like 10 years from now, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there's not that much there. It's like the 3D era just... I And again, I was saying I said when we were talking about the PlayStation Classic, I just think the 3D era just doesn't work for those classic micro consoles. It doesn't age too well. And also, like, I don't... It's not even that it doesn't age. It's that you're going to have better versions to play. It's like, so go back mm. and think about what would be on Xbox. Well... Halo, one and two. Well, there's a Master Chief collection that already 
Yeah. Knocks that out of the park. Or it's like, like, I mean, even Phantom Dust, you've got a yeah. free version of it. I mean, it all on the Xbox best games One have now. already, like, even co- like Conquer, like, you can play that better on, like, I mean, Xbox One X now. Like, I mean, you'd basically be doing a collection of, like, the crappy games everyone remembers but doesn't remember. It's like, yeah. it's like, oh, I haven't thought of Azuric and Nightcaster in forever. You know, it's like, but are you, you want to play that? Like, I mean, no. I Hell, don't. even Sudeki, was it, what's that one, Sudeki? Is it the, the weird right. pseudo JRPG thing yep. they made? Even that's playable. Yeah, but where's Brute Force Remastered? <laughs> Let's do that. How about that? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's enough meat on the original Xbox bone. And besides, they're already putting all the, oh, a ton of original Xbox, almost anything worth playing on the original Xbox is already backwards compatible yeah. on, the, on the Xbox One. I don't think Microsoft has any interest in that. Yep. Uh, one last one from Majora Tom ninety one. Uh, when Red Dead Online launches, you think we could get a session in? I'll play with you. Hmm. I'm already. I don't know if you guys saw in that footage, but your your gamer tags were probably all through that Forza Horizon footage. Yeah, the the drivatars get brought in from all over the yeah. friends list. If you've played if you've played any Forza. Yeah, I'm friends with so many of you guys. Like your gamer tags were all through that footage. So yeah, we'll get together. We'll play. Um, I, I think if you want to play, you should make sure you get the PS4 version. Uh, what version well, are you going to play? Xbox. One X. Yeah. yeah. You rich people. Got yeah. all these fancy, schmancy consoles. All right. Fancy consoles with the extra letters. <laughs> yep. That extra letter costs you a pretty penny. All right. So that's it for Game Face episode 141 here on Sifted Games. Uh, for those of you who came in late, we did show off the shirts, shirts earlier. I'm going to show them off again because I need you people to buy these so I don't lose my ass on them. <laughs> you want to go to my one shot? So there's the light blue with the dark blue screen. Here's the back. Here's the orange one. This is Matt's choice. He chose the orange. But that camera's out of focus. Probably made me look better the whole episode. That's good. <laughs> There's the orange. The little G4 orange. And on the back. You're, you're messing with me, Sandy. Keep jumping <laughs> chair. I, I see what you did there. Uh, the, so those are those two. And then I'm wearing the violet and white. So go buy them damn shirts so I don't lose my ass on them. I know you guys are going to love them just like you like the last one. So I think with that, Game Face is up and out. <laughs>